Hello everybody, we're live, it's Liquid Lunch coming at you. It's uh, November 6th, 2012, Sandra here. Hello. Only a month and a half left. I know, but you know, today Mercury goes retrograde. I know, I found out about that. When did you find out? This morning when I read my horoscope. Oh, see? Yeah. Has anything happened weird to you? Yet? Okay, I don't want to plant the seeds. Max so Brand came into the studio. <laughs> but <laughs> Max, that's just... Max, I'm just joking, okay? It's my job, I have to make jokes. See, he's wearing Val a red also shirt came into to the show studio. that anger, yes. It means actually, apparently what it means is technology goes woo-woo. Communications goes back. Yes, commun thank you. Because oh. it's so, Mercury, Mercury, yeah. the planet. So it's funny, because I do know people who are sending texts out, sending emails, they're not coming yeah, through. Me oh, really? too, that has happened. It's been happening it's, today. It just, they said today, really? and they said it yeah. could go two days before, right. and then it, I don't know, how long does this last? Till November 26th. That's it's a long right? time. Yeah. Don't it sign contracts. The they say never, don't sign contracts. By the way, when I said that, basically I haven't had any problems yet. I haven't either, oh. touch wood. So well, the only problems I've been having was there been some people calling me about wanting to have their 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 duck thing. Their you know the duck thing? Duck the duct duck. tape? No, 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 no. Something that the duck vent. Wanting to get clean and everything. Oh, oh yeah. So duck. you're a wrong number to a business or something? Yeah. And uh, well that's a communication well, issue. Yeah, that is. Also Max, you just had a big show, and Val, you went on the wrong I day. I went the wrong day. Right? Two days later, wasn't it? Max, what was it? What well, was your show? Yeah. That's hilarious. I was That's so playing funny. at the Wellish down on Woodbine and Danforth on a Saturday night, and I, I think I emailed Val that she, mm -hmm. she, she be, she be able to come, <laughs> but she went on the wrong day. I the, feel the really next embarrassed. Day. Oh, that is so funny. My guitar funny. player and I went just to, you know, support Max, because he's always there supporting us and other bands. And uh, we showed up, and there was no band there at all, except for a jam that was starting a little bit later. And we, we missed uh, Max by two days. Oh, my God, so that's So it's a little hilarious. bit of a delayed reaction. I'm sorry, Max. Don't worry. It's going to be on YouTube. Like, um, Billy Z came down and filmed um, one of my Great. songs that I was okay. performing. Awesome. <laughs> That's well, Max, you're gonna have funny. to send that link out because yes. we look forward to that. Because I, I know you got a great band, right? He Probably I actually one of the best bands that. in the city, really, in terms really of the, the performers. Group yeah, of guys yeah. There were some, there were some pictures on there of of, of, of my band. There's um, we usually have Jim playing bass, but the club can 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 fit you know some people on the stage. It's really small. So Wayne Corberg, oh. Co Co Concord playing bass, and Eugene Boyer on guitar. Mm -hmm. wow. wow. Yeah, okay. Keith, really small. Keith plays on drums. Yeah. And yours truly on vocals. So it was, it was great. So you'll, there's there's a lot of pictures of that that yeah. um, Pam and Tana took and others have, t have taken. And it's, right. it's on my Facebook. And if you are my friends on Facebook, you're fine. I'm going to friend you on Facebook. Well, I haven't friended you yet. Who couldn't be his friend on Facebook? I, I, mean, I didn't know on. you were on Facebook. He's I'm going to friend you. Plus, of course, you can subscribe to the Max Brand Report. Yes. Which I got last report. week. Is that the shiny blue shirt? Yes. <gasps> What's that club like, the Relish Club? It's beautiful, isn't it? Really? It's really this, nice. They have vegan food there. Oh, my God. They do. Oh, that means Sandra? You, oh, no. Sandra, you're going to love it. It's a really nice little place. Wow. It's very, very... Um, quaint it's very small so everybody feels like they're in their living room that kind of thing oh, and that's that's nice. that. so it's also small yeah and you can kind of get oh really close God. up with the band and oh, i like those kind of clubs you know yeah, what those yeah. kinds of clubs actually are the true i think indicator of true talent because if you can do something mm -hmm. that's intimate like that yeah. the rest is just icing on the cake yeah, it is. right because you're it not is. using all this stuff to kind of cover stuff up yes exactly right it's, it's more bare really bones nice. right really nice little club Okay, now we got to get down to business because okay. we got a couple things to talk about. Let's talk yeah. about what's going on with the Superstars contest, Val. Okay, Superstars uh, is great, overwhelming response um, via Yay. internet, which we're doing really good. A lot of people have to book in with me because they're coming from different areas throughout the city. Some can make it, some can't. So we're going to be extending the show, and it's we are the gonna auditions. You mean? The yes. Oh, the wow. auditions are going to be going on into uh, the end of December. Uh, which is fine, you know, bypassing Christmas and what have you. So it is open until the end of December, even all all via right. the in internet. Yay. And then uh, we will be doing the semis and the finals in January. Okay. Okay. So all the so all the actual events and performances of now are now rescheduled for January. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. But, good. But we are still doing open uh, auditions right. all November. Now, where do you do that? Where do you do that? They can go online. Yeah. And they can apply. 
Okay. They can send us videos, or we will be announcing what clubs we will be in that they can come and actually perform for a panel of judges. So okay. they'll have to go to the website to check that because it's different clubs and stuff. Which is right. superstars with, with a Z, Z dot CA. Dot CA, yeah. Okay. So Alrighty. Okay. Please go to the website. That's fantastic that you're extending it to allow for more talent to come yeah, forward some too. Some people they had to reschedule and they couldn't make it. So I'm kind of juggling for them for their. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, it's know, only so to that's fit them in. yeah. And also Errol would like to come and he's going to perform our producer Yay. of Superstars. On you the know, show here. He's on the show. Oh, yeah. and he's gonna bring awesome. His oh, yeah, right. Love him. Yeah. So Errol Starr will be coming. He's going to speak to you and book a date. Excellent. Okay. That's great. Now I know, uh, I, of course, Max had his show, but also uh, Val, I understand you're doing something coming up uh, on TV or something? Yep. I'm doing a Rogers new uh, pilot, a Rogers TV show called Sessions Toronto, where they um, have different Canadian talent come and perform and interview um, at their show. So it will be coming up on 26 that we record. You're allowed to come down and see the show if you like. Please at the Lula Lounge, At right? the Lula Lounge. It's going to be uh, Monday at about 10.30. So, so now this is where you're on the other side. You're not, this is where you're not a judge. Now you're performing. I'm yeah. performing now you're the one on rock stage. Band, yeah. Which yes. is a great band because I've seen them at the Hard Rock. Yeah, thank wow. you. Wow. You know what? It's so great because you are still performing out there. So, yep. you know, so when you have this contest going on, you're on, you know, on the judging side or on the yeah. MC side, but you're still out there. So you can still relate yes. to all of, you know, to, totally to the understand. front line because, because uh, you're, you're still doing it. Yes, definitely. And just to let you know, also this Friday, if you do want to come out and see the band play, I'm playing at Brigadoons at St. Clair and Victoria Park. Okay. And with my whole band. Come on down. When's that? Brigadoon. When? It's Friday. this Friday. Oh. Brigadoon, I love Yeah, that. I know it's fun. It's a small little club. It's a small club, on. another little quaint club, but you know, we've been played there four or five times already. So the name's bigger than the club? Exactly. They can barely get the whole name of Valerie and no, it actually says Valerie and Dreamcatchers. Not no, Valerie it says and Dodgers. Valerie they, Oh, there you go. The, At least they got a dream catchers because I would yeah. think it'd be like Dream Cat. That's it. No, they got the S in there finally. Instead of hers, forget I think hers. They, they ran out Cat of letters, hers. I think. I don't know. That's happened to me too before. <laughs> or typo. Val. Oh yeah, we're talking about typo. <laughs> hey, but you, what, what's the name of your band? So, well, at the time, it was the Japanese astronauts. Oh, definitely. They run out of letters. You know. Oh, my God. I wouldn't even know how to spell that. <laughs> I had to, you know, turn some letters upside down and wow. make stuff up. I just want to know how tape. you guys dressed <laughs> you know. for that. <laughs> okay. So, Val, so, uh, okay, so it's all under control. And people yes. can still uh, sign up for the contest, superstars.ca. Yes. And Max, the Max Brand Report will come out, and you're going to send and some video band, of your the show. The Max Brand Band. The Max the Brand Max Band. Say you that say that's 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 <laughs> Yeah, the Max Brand Band. Max Brand <laughs> Robot. <laughs> okay, Good. Val, and we look forward to having Aerostar Star on the show yes. soon. Yay! Star, I, yes. I'm excited. Okay, for that. guys, thanks for doing He's this awesome. today. Thank him. you so much, Sandra. Thank now you. we better get busy with the rest of the show, Sandra, because yes. we got we, we got to talk to them forever. Well, of course we could, and we will. <laughs> yeah, but after the show, or maybe down at Brigadoons, but Max Brand Band. We, wow. We have uh, Don, Donna Kekonge coming up in just Yay. a couple of minutes. Uh, Love she's got her a new energies. book coming out called How to Talk to Crazy People. Oh, wow. did she interview you for that book? I want one of those. Well, books. that's a good <laughs> good joke, Sandra. I good joke. I'm going to have to turn that over to the writers I and see if they can one. come up with a snappy <laughs> comeback. Um, also, uh, the Paddling Bryants are here. I'm really excited to talk to these guys. Uh, they're doing a 5,000 kilometer. Or did I don't know if they've done it yet or not, but it's going to be on TV. Wow, and it's, and and that's they, a reality show. They paddled from Alberta show. to really? New Orleans. Yeah, can you believe that? Really, seriously? That's great. Yeah, that's also, amazing. Uh, Graham and Monica are coming. Burr Love wise. them. Yes, okay. we're going to have some deep philosophical spiritual conversation. Yep, and right. Sean Dalton is going to be on the show too. Uh, talking about some, something political, no Politics. Doubt. So Politics. we go back from the spiritual something. to the political. And we've got some great videos today. great timing because we know what's going on today. Do we? Everybody knows oh, yeah, what's the, going on today. I was just going to mention that. It's not just that. merch. I know you were. Because we haven't even talked about it yet. I know. It's not just Mercury rec Retrograde. I know. It is Obama Romney time. It's, uh, yeah, Election Day in the U.S. So, um, and I understand there's a big, uh, the uh, Democrats abroad are holding a great big uh, event down at the Sheraton tonight. Here? Really? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot of Americans yeah, yeah. in in Canada and yes. in Toronto, and they're having a big party down at the uh, Sheraton tonight. Do you want to do you want to predict who's going to win? Well, I spoke to Brian Hassett this morning, 
who knows what's going on and he says and he's figured it out state by state and he says it's going to be uh, he gave his he re is he like Obama's the CNN gonna version going to get 303 of electoral votes or 330 and 330 and uh, Mitt is going to get 235 electoral votes, according to Brian Hassett. So, so we'll see how accurate he so is. That means Obama wins. That means by Obama 100. would win. Yeah. Although Mercury's retrograde, who knows so what could happen? Maybe it's the opposite. Could that? Especially be? because of the voting machines, which we know are are so easy to hack. In fact, I got a video right now okay. before we break. We're going to come back with Don in just a couple of minutes, but we got a video to show how the, vi the, the voting machines can get hacked and how the election can be thrown. And keep that in mind, if they try to do that in Canada, folks, we have to say no to that. So here's, uh, here's this video about the voting hack. We're going to come back with Donica Kange right after this. What is uh, th this issue of security? I mean, we move into the technology and it gets even more frightening. Yes, that's true. And these machines are very hackable. So if a machine is unsupervised for more than a minute, someone could get to it and put in a virus or a hack. This is crazy. Exactly. In fact, I learned firsthand from Princeton professor Edward Felton just how easy it is. This is a Diebold TS machine um, that is used in, uh, pretty widely around the country. And this is a hackable machine, is it not? It takes only about a minute with an unsupervised machine to insert the virus. The voting machine virus is on this memory card. All of the machines apparently use the same key. Anyone who can get the door open and stick in a memory card can uh, insert a virus or do whatever they like. Why don't you show me first how the machine works? One of the things they can do is what's called logic and accuracy testing, which is basically holding a pretend election. The virus is not kicking in yet, it's just lurking in the background. In this case, we have a race for president between George Washington and Benedict Arnold. And so I'll cast a test vote for George Washington. I'm going to be just renegade and vote for Benedict Arnold just for the fun of it. Okay. Now, if you look here in the middle, mm -hmm. it has the count, the vote count for our testing. George Washington, one vote. Benedict Arnold, one vote. Now we're hackers. We just did the test. The mm -hmm. test checked out. Now we're hackers. Yes. So this is the screen that a voter sees mm -hmm. on election day when they show up to vote. You've checked in at the front desk. Here's your voter card. OK, so for real, I have to vote for George Washington. Of course. Of course. We can cast a few more votes in our election, if you like. I'm going to vote for George Washington. I would do George Washington again. This virus has been instructed to steal the election for Benedict Arnold. The records have been modified so that the records inside the voting machine show two votes for Benedict Arnold and one vote for George Washington. So prove that it's stolen. What we see is that we don't have three votes for George Washington. So this machine has been highly compromised. This machine has been highly compromised. It counts the votes wrong. This particular voting machine in an election has a virus. Yes. Um, that's only one machine. How does that, if someone really has malicious intent, how does that go from machine to machine? The way it spreads is, uh, is on the removable memory cards. At the end of election day, if this card is taken back to headquarters, and it's put into a machine back there, the central election headquarters can be a sort of vector for the virus to spread. What do you think of this machine? Well, it's not a very secure machine. The Diebold machines we tested do not have a paper trail. The record tape on the inside of the machine can be altered by the virus, and there is no other record of how someone voted. Once they walk away, that vote can be lost or stolen, Lou. How long did it take the folks at Princeton to figure out how to do this? Well, they got the machine, but it took them about a month uh, to do it, and they did it with one professor and two graduate students. It didn't take them very long. This is enough, I would think, to worry just about anyone uh, responsible for an election. Thanks very much. Okay, welcome back to the show. So you see the whole, who, doesn't matter if whoever wins today, it could be just all rigged, Sandra. Well, isn't that really what it is anyway? I don't know. Retrograde or not. I don't know. Okay, well, let's uh, move on. We'll find out tomorrow. We've got uh, Donna Kakange joining us here. Donna, great to have you on. Thank you for having me back. And thank you for wearing the poppy. Well, I, I figured I would. I figured I'd try. Haven't so. seen too yeah. many of them, actually. Oh, they're out there. Yeah, they I have are. to get one. They are. Yeah, wow. they're there. Wow. They're right after yeah. Halloween they came out. Yes. Nice. I noticed. Okay. So now, Donna, uh, I know you got a book launch coming up, but is the book How to Talk to Crazy People, is it actually out yet? or what's It's the not officially out yet. It actually went to the printer today, okay. and it'll be out November 26th, the same day of the book launch. It's available. 
Oh, okay, November great. November 26th. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a party. The book will be available. Are you going to read exactly. from the book? What? I'll read from the book and, you know, I'll, I'll uh, uh, and hopefully people will buy it. And, you know, I'm going to talk about some other books I've done about the politics of black hair. And, uh, yeah, and that's the way the, the evening will go. And everybody here is invited. The politics <laughs> of black hair? Yeah, yeah, because I have some other books that I've self-published on the politics of black hair. So I'll, okay, I guess I'll we won't even go into that. that in. But wow, uh, yeah, that's, that's an kind interesting of a different topic. topic. Holy so, cow! So yeah, so and I'm actually doing some hair blogging around that right now. But that's hair that's, blogging. Uh, yeah. So, but uh, the, the, but for a website called Hairstyle Trends, and um, but uh, but yeah, the book How to Talk to Crazy People that'll be the focus of the event on the 26th, and that's happening at Accents on Eglinton Bookstore. It uh, definitely in Eglinton ah. and uh, is it so, east yeah. or west uh, well, it's actually west on the it's north west. or the south side on the north side okay. on the north side Dufferin and Eglinton it's very close to Maria Shuka I think Shuka is how the last name is pronounced public library oh, up okay. there yes, so yes, yeah yes, not, yes. not too far away from there and um, yeah so it's it's a good space it's a great great space they've got lots of books there too and um, so it's yeah it'll be a good evening what it'll time does good. that start 7, 7 p.m. People. 7 okay great 7 p.m. Uh, okay so so that's with uh, this book is with uh, how to talk to crazy people is with Life Rattle Press and then um, as well Life Rattle Press has um, their totally unknown writers festival collection 2012 coming out oh, very and cool. uh, that'll be at the Rivoli on November 21st um, at uh, I think doors open actually at six or seven, six or seven, something like that. You can check the liferattle.ca website for more information. And are you going to be at that one as well? I will be there. Uh, I was part of the collection last year. Uh, that was actually my debut in with Life Rattle Press, and uh, I'll be introducing one of the authors. Because you're no longer. <laughs> no, no, I don't know about that, but <laughs> <laughs> so so. What was the response like when you were there last year? It was fantastic. It was really, really good. Wow. A very welcoming community. Um, my wow. sister, my mom came out. Um, it, it was it was it was really it was fantastic. It was that the publisher was there. Um, all the writers were there. Writers from the past were there. Like the whole kind of anybody interested in Life Rattle Press and what they do because they also have Life Rattle Radio radio as well and these are podcasts that you can get on iTunes and then it, okay. it airs live each night on Thursday uh, Thursday night so you could get it from all over the world and you access it from all over the world and great great stories you, you hear wow so yeah yeah wow. and that happens every Thursday night nice. so, yeah and Life Rattle Press is a nonprofit, so so it's it's basically like an incubator for people who want to write, and it gives them a chance to be able to do it. You do they know? focus so on specific topics, Donna? Like all different kind of topics. You know, really the f the focus is creative nonfiction. So it has to be basically a true story, but done in a literary way. Okay. You know, okay. so okay. so yeah, so it's and and the editor, the proofreader, the copy editor, um, the the, the public they're all they're all fantastic and they really they they probably give you I would suspect more attention than even like random house mm -hmm, or places mm -hmm, like that would because mm -hmm. they know they're working really basically with new upcoming writers that aren't necessarily that used to the traditional publishing process these these aren't the JK Rawlings right yes, yeah. these are the people that may have that kind of talent but they're just not that known yet now but if they become a JK Rowling do they still stay with life rattle or do they well, move what, to what 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 then uh, happens is that um, they, they encourage this as well. Like they hoped it, a bigger publisher will kind of buy the book from them and take and okay. take it over. And you know the writer has copyright, but like you know they just find the book over and will take it on and give it mainly marketing is the main thing that they can't necessarily provide. So because they're a nonprofit, so you won't oh. see posters like what you can see in the TTC, like the girl with oh. the snake tattoo or whatever. You're not yes. going to see see that because okay. you know even uh, uh, it's paying money to have a launch at the Gladstone you know they, they got to count their pennies right so so you know whereas Random House can have it at the Liberty Grand if they wanted to right so yeah. you can just invite every single person you've ever known so but uh, but yeah so it's you know so they encourage that wow yeah so 
Now let's talk uh, a little bit about this book. Uh, and I understand this isn't the original title. You had a different title for it, it. It did have a different title. It was originally called Only My Voice. And um, and then uh, Lori Callis, who's the managing editor, she calls me up one day and she says, I think that title is a little flat. <laughs> and, uh, and, and how about this? How to talk to crazy people. So I kind of stop for a moment, think about it. I'm like, okay, <laughs> so and and there there it went. So so even when sometimes like I'll Google the title only my voice and then stuff comes up and it's like you know so but it it's now officially called How to Talk to Crazy People. So let's talk about what the book is actually about. Let's get into the is meat it, and is potatoes. It, yeah. Is it self-explanatory? Well, you know, I think a big well, reason. Uh, well, you know, I think a big reason why uh, How to Talk to Crazy People is a much better title <laughs> is because there's actually a chapter in the book um, in the second section um, that's called how to talk to crazy people and it's about an experience where um, I'm in Uganda Kampala Uganda and um, my aunt um, there who's a medical doctor um, I'm going through a crisis and uh, she um, uh, manages to calm me down without me needing to be hospitalized and I've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder so it's about the experience of bipolar disorder. So um, she calms me down just through her words and, and what she says. And, and I just calm down, go to sleep, wow. and everything is fine. Wonderful. So Wonderful. that's actually why um, uh, it, it, it was just seen that that title was better to have. Is it, though, is it, even though that's, and it does sound like a great title, but is it also, mm -hmm. can someone reading the book, Mm -hmm. Because there's, there's, you know, people oh, who yeah. know people or, or family members who have bipolar, sometimes it's difficult to deal with without with those people. Yeah. And yeah. I'm just wondering if people who read the book, will they gain an insight into how they can mm -hmm. help deal with mm -hmm. and, and help their friends and, and family who might be dealing mm -hmm. with this? I mm -hmm. think definitely insight can be had um, by reading the book and um, my own psychiatrist Anna Skorzewska uh, actually uh, did a review for the book and um, and she thinks it's something that anybody in the mental health field and even if they're not in the mental health field should read and uh, um, it's 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 important as as a mental health text a woman who is um, diagnosed schizophrenic and um, wrote a book called mindful of scorpion uh, she read the book and uh, felt it was also something that is insightful. It, mm -hmm. it, it does lend to um, the body of knowledge that's out there. Um, uh, the copy editor, John Dunford, he actually, his comments on it were mainly that um, he felt that what he really liked about it was the fact that it's not written in the past tense mm -hmm. necessarily, which is great. It's mainly written in the, in the active voice. And since it's mm -hmm. written in the active voice, it's kind of like you're right there in the moment. Moment. It's not so much a reflection nice. piece. Yeah. And um, and David Cherry Andy, who uh, wrote a book, a wonderful book called Sukion, and he has another book coming out called Brother um, with McClellan and Stewart. Sukion came out with Arsenal Pulp Press, and uh, and he wrote a, a review for the book too. And his he he also commented on the writing. As somebody who's a writer, he's a professor of English at Simon Fraser University, and um, and he felt. It was also very well written too. So in in that kind of you know because so you've got really the, good support it, backing yeah, you up here, which is great because it at at the end of the day a book is a product, right? So you're trying to get a product that is um, good to read and plus informative and enjoyable and creates an experience. And I think for all that, it definitely does do that. Like plus plus the topic's a touchy topic and can be absolutely. considered intimidating. Yes. Right. Yes. So, absolutely. And fearful. Uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. So I think me a book is a good kind of way to discuss this kind of topic for maybe somebody who may be questioning themselves about what they're going through or maybe somebody that they know or just wants to know more about this topic and doesn't really understand what really is meant by crazy. Isn't everybody crazy? And then really mm -hmm. understanding True. that like, you know, okay, well, what is the difference between kind of like having a day where like, you know, you're forgetting your keys everywhere you go or like you know the kind of 
other spectrums that, that can be had. So, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's it's good in that sense. I think it, it really it really really is a good book. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, a thank, little. Thanks to my editor, my goodness. And my you, <laughs> now you mentioned the one chapter, which is actually called "How to Talk to Crazy People." Mm -hmm. But can you just kind of describe, you know, what's in the book? the arc of, of Yeah, the book. so basically the first part of the book um, explores uh, my experience um, after uh, I come out of undergrad and um, and my first, right, starts right from my first hospitalization. And then from my first hospitalization, it goes into um, basically uh, how I got there. No, no just you know? before, so, I mean, I mean, it's a big, fascinating topic. Can I just ask yeah. you, so how old were you when you had your first First episode. Was there any sign when you were growing up prior to that that there was something that was going to well, hit you at that yeah, age? Yeah, that's or? an excellent question. I mean, um, not not particularly. Like you know, I was a good student, um, active in sports at certain times in my life, especially when I was much younger, um, high strung for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but so are a lot of us, exactly. and we don't have that issue. Exactly. Um, but uh, there are certain situations that occurred, um, certain genetic situations mm -hmm. that are in place as mm -hmm. well, um, that if you read the book, you'll, you kind of, yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll you can start see a pattern. To, you, 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 you'll see the pieces of the puzzle. But you'll do you know what causes it? Or, or was there anything that, that triggered it, it do you A think? number of things can cause it. Like, then I can talk in more general sense, right? Like, you know, like McGill University did an entire uh, 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 symposium a number of years back and um, about how oftentimes drug use can, can trigger um, uh, a mental breakdown. Now, I was not ever anybody who was a big drug user. User, but I discovered by just trying marijuana once that I'm allergic wow. to it, and, okay. and it that can ended trigger flipping something. me. It contributed to me flipping into mania, right? So, so oh that that goodness. see, some people that doesn't do that yeah, to them, they yeah. can smoke it every single day of their lives, and it doesn't no do issue. that. But it's the same way that some people are also very allergic to cigarette smoke. You know, and they will gasp as though they're gonna die. Like you know, if even they smell it, right? So and so it's you know, everybody is different, basically, right? You know, so, and it's in, in. I think not just the drugs. I mm -hmm. think that a lot of when you first asked that question and you were talking about the, the study, mm -hmm. I think actually there's a lot of the chemicals that we have in our food. It, that's true. And, and in our food, soil can food, also food, trigger. Food is actually a really big thing. And like now, um, I've actually written now a follow-up to, it, it's just a draft and it's in no way publishable, but uh, with a working title, who knows, it may change, um, <laughs> called Crazy People Talking Sane. Uh, oh wow, that's of amazing, I love life. that. Yeah, Crazy People Talking Sane. Because basically I've, what I've managed to do here um, at this point in my life is almost 10 years manage my bipolar disorder so congratulations I mean, I went that's from wonderful having, like you know 16 hospitalizations to managing it for the past 10 years so wow. and uh, so it's more it's 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 I wouldn't necessarily say how to talk to crazy people is like a happy kind of book but it does have a certain sense of optimism and um, and optimism and and hope to it as well like that comes through right so and um, wow. but crazy people talking saying is more about okay managing kind of like the, the the good things how to get you know like I don't drink um, I'm on the path of trying not to smoke I'm wearing the patch you know so and uh, and getting to the point where I'm not smoking anymore um, there's I don't there's certain things I just really can't do I can't go out partying all night long like I'd love to do many times but I just can't really do that because I got to really watch my sleep you know, I can't go to McDonald's three times a day. Like, you well, know, that's actually I a blessing. What, yeah, that's it actually, actually a blessing. is a blessing. It actually is a blessing. I got to really watch what I eat. So and make sure it's really healthy and it's nutritious. I'm getting my fruits and vegetables and, you know, I'm starting not to eat um, uh, red meat and things like this. And this you know, has a food. positive 
um, yeah. impact on your it's, it's, on the bipolar? It's really, it's really had a very positive impact. I well, mean, I think the next time I see my psychiatrist, it's going to be like, wow. The last time she saw me, I see her twice a year. Last time she saw me, she was like, oh my goodness, you're alive. And then, and then, uh, well, I that's think positive. Like, <laughs> 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 what did you expect? Will. Take it how you will. <laughs> and and the next time I see her, she'll she'll be like, well, I, okay, I think I'm. I, I, she also read the book, so uh, you know, I think she'll be glad that things are coming along nicely. So it's taken some time, mind you. <laughs> Well, you yeah. know what, if, if we can say, if we have, you know, definitive proof that, um, you know, the antibiotics that are fed to the animals are mm -hmm. decreasing our immunity to antibiotics, mm -hmm. if it can flow in the stream, if it can affect our immune system, it mm -hmm. can, oh, what's to say it wouldn't affect our mental health system? Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. So how we don't, and diabetes is directly, or adult onset di diabetes is directly related to diet. So if, exactly. it can your, if, exactly. if it can affect your endocrine system, exactly. Yep. Like even how, with how diabetes, these are your... health issues. These yeah. are basically health issues. So in mental health, there's all no my sea other... salt. You know, yeah. I used to take salt. I used to be cooking, cooking, and and salt would be on my fingers. Sea salt. I love sea salt. I would lick my fingers with sea salt on it. Like now, I throw it all out. I use this like. What is something stuff. wrong with sea salt? Uh, it's not good for you if you have high blood pressure. I have high blood pressure. Oh. You know what apparently is good? Speaking of that, is um, Himalayan. Salt. Really? Apparently, there's it's it's um, it's not a sea salt, mm -hmm. but apparently it is actually very very healthy for you to take even if you mm -hmm. have high blood pressure. It's actually very needed salt. It's got all kinds of stuff in it. It's pink. Interesting. It's pink. It's pink. Interesting. It tastes very different though, and don't imagine. use a lot. I can imagine. And at first, I thought it was awful. Well, I eat a lot of fish. I eat a lot of fish, and I I also um, use this uh, uh, President's Choice brand from Loblaws, it's like no salt kind of Mrs. Dash yes, type of yes, thing. Yes, yes, so, yes. So oh, that's I good, that. and that's not so mono. It's great. It's mono great. sodium. It's great. Glutamate. It's great. It's great. Yeah, it's, it's so, natural yeah. stuff. Right? I, I yeah. really do think yeah. there's a lot to that, though, because mm -hmm. mental health is just one other aspect of the whole body, right? Mm -hmm. But we tend to have the stigma that okay, it's okay if you're diabetic. We don't look at that as that stigma. That's right. But that's mental right. Health, ooh, it's okay if you have heart disease but mental health oh you, you know we can't talk about that that's right and actually you know and, but the states is actually speaking in states in their election and everything they're um, ahead in in the whole mental health discussion in some ways because well, they're good. actually considering um, changing because uh, right now it's kind of normalized to call it mental health or mental illness right uh, in the states they're actually moving towards calling it co-concurring disorders co-concurring disorders so understanding and feeling that with that frame or that catchphrase I mean labels are one thing and yes they can be discussed and all these kinds of things but co-concurring disorders is supposed to be able to take into account all the contributing factors wow, that, okay. that create a situation any point of illness right so even be it cancer be it heart wow, disease okay, be it okay. anything so it's more integrative co-concurring disorders exactly a more holistic approach yes. Yes. Right, so to understanding what illness is really about, and that it's not just simply like, okay, so I smoked a spliff one day and then I end up in the hospital, or okay, so um, my dad also had a breakdown when he was 16. I have a, I have a aunt that also um, suffered from depression. I have, you know, it's just not, it's not always that simple because there's tons of people who could also have genetics running yes, through their yes, system, and they still do not end up ill. Right. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so it's, um, it's, you know, or with disease basically. So, so yeah, so it's, it's, um, we're, we're, we still got a lot of work to do on all these things. So, so my book is, is, um, it contributes to the discussion. It contributes to the That's discussion. That's a really good way to put and it. And I hope that, um, other people will be inspired to also write their own stories too. Cause that's the best you can do. You can't talk for other people really at no, the end of the no, day, right? No. The best you can do is just, each of us yeah. has to do our own part yeah. in preventing the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's a good title for a book. The zombie I love that. apocalypse. I love that. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> Beware, people. Okay. So you did interview him for the book, didn't you? How to talk to crazy people. I, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't interview you. He no. could be the chapter on the zombie <laughs> apocalypse. I didn't interview you. No, no. But he's coming to my book launch. I am right? looking forward to it. Yes. So it's he's November. With his wife. November twenty sixth at uh, no, 
Wrong oh, information. Oh. What, what's the <laughs> date? November 26, 7 oh. p.m. Okay. 7 p.m. And uh, is at Accents on Eglinton Bookstore. I believe the address is like 1784 Eglinton Street West, but I could be wrong. Just about west that. of Dufferin on I the north side, right? Yes, exactly. Just look for the exactly, bookstore. Exactly. Okay, well, we look forward to that. We look okay. forward to the book coming out. Good and luck uh, to you. it sounds Thank like, you. Donna, Thank that you. it's really for people who people who might know somebody who's got bipolar, mm -hmm. maybe somebody who's got bipolar might get some insights on how That's they can right. deal with it, and That's also right. anybody who's just generally interested in preventing the zombie apocalypse. Exactly. Okay. We should be everybody. Which problem. should be everybody, because <laughs> except maybe a zombie. Okay. Um, it's called The Matrix. Donna, do you have a website or something yeah, where I people do. can get and stay in touch I with do. you? Uh, if you plus, uh, the book is available for pre-order. Um, so if you go to the liferattle.ca uh, website, um, you can pre-order the book, and I encourage you to do so. It will come on the 26th. Life Rattle Press is a very good organization, and uh, and as well, uh, my website is donnakakonge.com. D O N N A K A K O N G E. Dot com. And they can sign up for your blog there? Well, my you yeah, you can go to the link for okay. Donna Magazine and you so can subscribe to my blog, which would be absolutely fantastic. So, okay, great. Because yes. then so, they yeah. can find out about the hair. Yeah, yes. exactly. You have to come back and talk about that. <laughs> I want to get into that. Maybe you yeah. find yeah. out. Woo, maybe more reasons even. to come back. And, and not the ear of Hugh and Sandra. <laughs> you know what I want to find out? What? What's a spliff? You don't know what a spliff oh, is? Oh, you don't know what a spliff is? Oh, my goodness, girl. See, this is why she looks like this. Okay, okay we need to have, uh, <laughs> maybe we'll get some video on that. We can show Sandra what a spliff is. <laughs> Although I'll have Should to I be embarrassed that I don't know what no, no, be proud. Be proud. This is how I'm hoping my nieces turn out. <laughs> okay, okay, I think I have a clue now. All right. Okay. All right, Donna. Thanks for doing this. Okay. We're going to take a little break. Hey, we got the Bryans here. We got uh, Brian Adams. That's right. Brian Adams is here. And uh, Wilder Weir uh, from the Paddling Bryans, which is uh, airing on the Travel and Escape this channel. This is the Brian Adams. And we're going to watch wow. a little bit of, about their first canoe trip. And we're going to come back and chat with these guys right after this. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I start now with that. <laughs> I'm Brian Walwork, and I'm canoeing from Alberta to, I'm going to start. Uh, <laughs> Hi, I'm Brian Walwork from Montreal. <laughs> My name is Brian Adams, I'm from saint Sever, Quebec. We first uh, came up with this idea sitting uh, two, two years ago in around July in Brian's backyard. I don't know, it's just a route. It was just an idea. It's just a crazy idea, you know? We're just, we're going out on an adventure. We're, we're going to try and do the largest river system in North America. We didn't look for sponsors or... It's all self-funded. And we lived in a really crappy apartment for the last year because we haven't spent any money on anything. We made a plan and we want to see if we could, you know, pull through on it. Yeah, it's, it's just a really long canoe trip, man. <laughs> it's 5,000 kilometers of paddling downstream. Now it's time to go. We're about to go out on, uh, on a big adventure down from, uh, from Milk River, Alberta, all the way to New Orleans, 5,500 kilometers or so in a paddle boat. And uh, yeah, hopefully it should only take us half a year. It would be cool to do the trip in a motorboat or whatever, but it wouldn't have the same meaning, you know? We're Canadians and we're gonna paddle a canoe, man. <laughs> we're just saying, we're out. We'll see you guys in New Orleans. No one back home has believed us until we were, you know, pulling out of the driveway. Now is the time to let go Trust in me and let it flow Leave your worries far behind It's gonna be sad leaving here though. We met some people that are just gonna be friends for life. I got so many people praying for me and all this stuff. And the other half are like, wow, great, man. Go have the time of your life. So we're, we're hoping for the time of our life. You know? Oh, little brother. 
I'm, I'm 91 years old. I was born in Elk River and I've lived here all my life. It, I've been going down the river every, just about every, every year. year. Yeah. Up until last year? Yeah. I didn't go in last year and I didn't go this year. Okay, so the last two years. Yeah. Yeah. When I turned 90, I thought that was enough. This 91 year old lady, she, she comes here with her daughter. They've paddled this river their whole lives. I guess I'm driven to do this to see if I could if I could do it. I've always loved like road trips where you don't know where you're going and you're just hopping out somewhere and I like adventures and I like not knowing what's gonna happen the next day. So hopefully there'll be a lot of that in store for us. You know what you know what the trick is to this one? Good hiking shoes and wool socks, man. I don't care if it's winter, summer, whatever. Wool socks is the key. When it's hot, they absorb the sweat. When it's cold, they keep the hot in. But you're the only thing that's not sweating. There's a lot on our plate right now. But I think I think uh, just getting in the water, it's it's go big or go home, eh? Oh. See you guys later. Oh, rolling, rolling down the white water. That's how. I don't know how that song goes, man. Do you? No, not really. Good. I mean, we've only been on the river for maybe two hours, probably not, and we've done at least 12 kilometers. So, I mean, when we're traveling good like this and the water's high... And Okay, we're back on the show here, and we've got, uh, well, Brian Adams, uh, who's one of the actual paddlers, and uh, Wilder Weir. He doesn't paddle a guitar. <laughs> That's right. Hardly anybody does. <laughs> Except for maybe uh, Bruce Coburn in one of his videos, but I'm just guessing. I don't know if he actually did or not. Okay, and Wilder Weir. <laughs> don't want me singing either, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now, and Wilder, you're one of the producers yes, of the show, which is called The Paddling Bryans on... Um, the Travel and Escape Channel, Channel 267 on Rogers. And uh, let's talk about this a little bit because, uh, I mean, Wilder, you were just mentioning, uh, how did this happen? It's, it's an, it sounds like a fantastic adventure. Well, what is it? It, it? It's kind of funny. It started off with just me and, uh, and my best friend, uh, Brian. We were hanging out one day, having beers in the backyard, and uh, decided <laughs> we wanted to go on an adventure. Great and source for inspiration. No, wait a second. Where were backyard. you? What backyard? What part of the country well, were you? Well, this was actually this was in Montreal, back, <laughs> okay. uh, back in Montreal, and um, the West Island of Montreal. And we were drinking a couple, maybe a couple too many beers, and we came up with this great idea that we wanted to canoe across the United States. And we, wanted, we, we knew that there was a way to go from Alberta all the way to New Orleans and and we just we really wanted to do it and funny enough nobody nobody believed we were going to do it and nobody had any faith in us well did you and approach them when you were still drunk with beer no because no, no, no. that might play a part <laughs> in it. no we we're one of those people that actually woke up the next morning and still wanted to do the adventure that we came and you still remembered oh, it oh, that's okay. amazing <laughs> that, I mean, that means there was probably no I won't say it. <laughs> I was gonna use the spliff word again <laughs> oh well but, I knew I knew what the spliff was. <laughs> <laughs> no I know usually okay anyway so Brian uh, uh, did you read Huck Finn when you were a kid or when um, you were younger? Not, not when I was a kid but when, when I was older and yeah I, I love that because story. when I read that I, when I read that book I went out and built a raft I just to had play. to do that right uh, I just wanted to do that and it, going down the Mississippi just sounds like a great idea yeah. so that wasn't beer. your source of inspiration our, our the source beer of inspiration was, what are you uh, well I mean the part, partly the beer but uh, <laughs> a lot of it also was a, a book called Paddle to the Amazon Okay. And uh, it's about uh, this father and his son, Don Starkle, and his two sons, that uh, he was kind of a crazy adventurer too, and dragged his two boys uh, from Saskatchewan, or Winnipeg, all the way down to the mouth of the Amazon. So he, he went further than us, and this was in the 70s. Oh, wait a sec. They, did they paddle down? Yeah, they paddled. The along way. the coast of the Gulf? Or, uh, uh, yeah, along the coast of the Gulf wow. for a long time. I think I heard about that book. It, it was, it's a really great book. Yeah. And, and then lots of... Uh, Water okay. Wow. Now I'm just thinking. You, there you are in Montreal, <laughs> right? Picture this. Now I would think, like, I mean, when you read about the history of Canada, the Courier de Bois that went from Montreal and they went 
west across Canada. They had to cross the uh, the divide, and and they kept they went all the way to Alberta. They went yeah. that away, mm -hmm. not the other way. Well, and you were already in Montreal. I'm just, I mean, is there? Are, are you planning yeah, to I mean, do something it's, like that? It's maybe? part of the inspirations from the Huck Finn part of it that we wanted to float downriver and not like the Cora de Bois. They went up up river the yeah, whole time. Yeah, that's true. Right? So, so much. Actually, so much I'm on more your work. side with that. <laughs> Going downriver is way better. Yeah. So you can actually go downriver and have a couple of beers in your hand. Exactly. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. It's, it's, just a, it's just a way to an exp extend their beer escapades. That's all this is, right? <laughs> it was. It was only just meant to be a long vacation, but luckily. We, we had our, our friend Wilder was the only person that really believed in us since the beginning and he handed us a very fancy camera on the first trip before he even knew that there was a chance of making a TV show. And I didn't think I was going to get the camera back. With a name but, like uh, Wilder, how could he not believe in you? Come on, <laughs> seriously. Now, did you have an, the idea of actually bringing this to TV or was it just, you know, you're doing a trip like that, it's awesome, take a camera with you, capture some of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, this, kind of the story goes, um, I knew Brian Walwark, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Uh, he's working in Saskatoon, uh, where it's very cold. He's not in a nice warm studio like this one, but... <laughs> yeah. uh, Adam's able to come down, but uh, I've known Walwork for forever. Uh, we played hockey together, grew up together, and um, I always got to keep, you know, tried to keep in touch with them and, and hang out with them when I was back in, in Montreal. And um, he was there, and Adams was there, and they were, we were at this pub, and they're telling me about this crazy adventure that they were going to uh, they were going to try and do. And um, <laughs> the first, my first thought was that they were going to die, and my second <laughs> you thought to video that. was that yeah, you should film that. You know, that could be good TV. Uh, I've always uh, it's a real you know, reality exactly. show. Exactly, that that sounds like good TV. So uh, so I was always kind of in uh, you know I'm a film student from Queens, um, and I've always kind of been in the TV world here in Toronto and. Uh, you know, I just thought it could be a, gr a great story. I knew these guys were just, you know, very genuine and not your typical travel hosts. Um, you know, they drink beer and they're and, uh, and they're Canadian and uh, and they're crazy guys. And I've always been insanely entertained by them and their antics. <laughs> so I thought, hey, you know what? Let's try and uh, you know take a chance and give them a camera and see what they come back with. And they came back with about 120 some odd hours of some of the most incredible footage I've ever seen. Um, in the first amazing? season, they um, got stuck uh, in a few different pretty tight spots. Uh, and if you tune in, uh, you can see that um, the, the, f the water was freezing at one point. Um, he was held at gunpoint at one point. <laughs> what? Um, there was lots of crazy uh, things that happened along the way. Wow. Um, I hope you were wearing a GoPro. <laughs> <laughs> not, not at that point. <laughs> But when I started watching this stuff, I said, wow, there's some, you know, some incredible stories here. And, uh, you know, I teamed up with my co-producer, Claude Barnes, who's an incredibly talented producer, who's been in the game for forever. And, um, and uh, you know, he agreed with me. He thought there's some great, a great story here. So we started uh, putting together some of the footage. And, and uh, luckily, uh, Travel and Escape was able to, you know, get a hold of it uh, through Claude. And, um, you know, God bless him for taking a chance on a small wow. Canadian production. And uh, and after the first season, we actually were the number one original program for Travel and Escape, wow, and uh, that's now amazing. we've just shot our second season. So, which is a uh, was already premiered. It's airing right now on Travel and Escape uh, Mondays at ten. Okay, so let's. So the first season, you went from Alberta to New Orleans, oh, yeah. and I want to ask you about that uh, just a little bit because. Yeah. I suspect there was some portaging involved because you have to go over the the, the, the divide, right? The continental divide no, at some point. No, luckily no? that's all part of the same. Oh, okay. Well, that's all uh, part of. It's the I don't know what watershed it's actually officially called, but it all drains into the Gulf. Okay. Uh, but there are about seven major dams uh, yeah. along the Missouri River that we had to portage. That uh, one of them took us about a day and a half to do wow. <laughs> almost, and. I mean, it was it was quite a long, uh, quite a long portage that we had to do. On, on top of the fact that we had 800 pounds of gear with us whenever we were. Did you have wow. to make a couple of trips? Uh, wow. Luckily, we had it set up so we didn't. We oh, only okay. we, we'd do it just like one yeah. trip. Yeah. Uh, we had a wheel system for the canoe, okay. and we'd stick a bunch of gear in that, and and I would pull some of the other stuff. But most of the trips back and forth, it was all because of uh, of the camera. Because we were oh. out there by ourselves the first time. So it was just the two of you. It was just so the you two had of no us. crew, just you no, guys shooting. And, and no camera knowledge so, either. So you would just I mean. shoot mm. the other Brian, and the other Brian would just shoot you, or you would shoot scenery. That, or we'd put up a tripod and then walk past it and go back and get it and, <laughs> and do that whole. This uh, is just walking past. <laughs> now, did, did you find? I mean, I'm just curious, but did you find? You know that there's the the whole beauty of doing a canoe trip 
And then there's the beauty of doing a TV show. Did you find wow. that shooting the the, sh the the video interfered with the joy of, of the canoe trip or vice versa? Um, it, it didn't really interfere with the joy of it because I don't think we were actually planning they would ever make a TV show. So uh -huh. we kind of looked at it like this is going to be such a great video for us and our friends to show everybody what we did for the six months okay. that we were out there. So that begs the question, Wilder, you had tw 120 hours. <laughs> How much was actually arable of that Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, we were making uh, lemonade of lemons there for sure. Uh, <laughs> I had to, uh, I had to write a few strong word letters to you guys on the on the trip uh, <laughs> enough drunken <laughs> footage yeah <laughs> but uh, but honestly uh, for the most part uh, we, we I was just um, the, I mean the visuals were just you know surreal wow. and um, and the fact that they were really out there on their own with no crew um, really I don't know for me it was just uh, it was really compelling, and it's something that I was happy to be in an editing suite watching it and so not being <laughs> actually out there with them. If I watch this, then do I actually get a feel for what it's like to, to actually take that trip myself? Is that the idea? Well, hopefully we showed you as much as we could of, of what the actual trip was like. I mean, the, the three weeks that we had where it was uh, minus 20 degrees out, uh, I mean, you can't really, you don't get the grasp yeah. of how actually cold we were because we were in a tent, so we just never wow. warmed up, you know, even wow. having fires lit all night and things like didn't that. Didn't help, you know, eh? Does, it doesn't help. And I mean, we started up in Montana and we were getting 120 degree heat. So, wow. I mean, we. Where did it get cold? It got I cold mean, it outside of St. Louis. At what time of year? Like, what was the? We we actually we left in August. Uh, we yeah. were a bit behind schedule on uh, on our oh. leaving day. We left in August, and we were down by St. Louis by Christmas time, oh, okay. just right around Christmas time. And we kind of thought that once we got down to St. Louis, that there wasn't any more snow, or mm -hmm. we didn't really have to worry mm -hmm. about it anymore. But sure enough, it, it freezes and they do have wow. a hockey team. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Should have caught on with that. Good point. Good point. There's some amazing shots of uh, Brian's, uh, you know, gloved hand. Um, just you basically couldn't even see the glove anymore. It was just a giant block of ice around his oh left hand. Oh my God! And uh, and and they both grew their beards out. A six-month beard. Uh, did that help to keep you warm? It, oh, it did. It, it definitely yeah. did. Isn't that amazing? It was eh? pretty yeah. crazy. And uh, when we actually got down to New Orleans uh, at the end of the trip, uh, they shaved each other's beards off. So did the bears call you fun. brother? <laughs> No, no, we, uh, I, I really... Did you really run into any bears or anything like that? We didn't, we didn't run into any bears. There was a, a big scare in Montana and North Dakota with, uh, with cougars, actually. Oh, wow. Not, uh, not the older lady cougars, but the, uh... <laughs> oh, okay. The, the, the okay. very, uh, They can be worse. <laughs> the, they can be, I'm sure. <laughs> Much worse, but the, uh... Yeah, really, I think, I think the, the animal cougar's probably the nicer one. <laughs> probably. So where'd you get held up at gunpoint? <laughs> oh, boy, yeah, what a story. Um, in Missouri, actually, in a small town uh, called Kimswick, outside of uh, St. Louis, and uh, we had been uh, in Montana. We'd been given a gun by a, a concerned rancher, had given us a, a, a firearm because he was worried about uh, the mountain lions. Because in, in some of their towns, they actually had mountain lions walking into the mm -hmm. like the downtown part of the town. So they're like, you, you know, you guys, you should be careful. You should have a gun. Okay, at that point, I'd be rethinking my trip. <laughs> really? Well, I mean, it, it was kind of nice. He did take the gun out of his bedside table and said, "Here, take, <laughs> take my yeah, handgun." Yeah, but okay, now this is real. Okay, this guy's doing this. Whoa, that's yeah, pretty heavy. So I mean, we were a bit, we were a bit nervous about it, but at the same time. Um, he made a good point. He's like, you know what? The the way we look at it in, in Montana is it's better to have a gun and, and not need it than yeah, need a gun have, and yeah. not have it. And we, we, we agreed with that a little bit. And so sure enough, when we got down into Missouri, we were at a, a house party with some, some very nice gentlemen that, that put us up. And him and his wife had gone into a domestic dispute. The police got called. Um, as the police show up, the owner of the house, I'm inside trying to calm him down. Uh, uh, you know, trying to like divert the, the situation a little bit so that, you know, nothing, nothing goes too wrong. He gets scared when he sees the cops coming in, so he locks both the doors and drags me into the bathroom. And so I'm sitting in the bathroom with him, and I'm like, well... You're like hostage? Held hostage? Sort of. It was more just like, no, we have to go into the bathroom. And he was, he was a little bit intoxicated, and so I was telling him, Johnny, uh, you know, maybe we need to, like, you know, open the door for the police because they're the state troopers. And they're knocking on the door. And your wife's outside and she has the keys. Like, you know, <laughs> like they're going to come in. <laughs> so sure enough, he doesn't want to do any of that. The, the cops come in and once they're in the house, he's like, okay, you're right. I give up. Which, I mean, he had no reason to be hiding anyways, but 
Uh, so then, yeah, the, uh, the, the cops came, uh, <laughs> put a gun in my face, handcuffed me. And as, um, as we were going through the, uh, the whole story of I came here on a canoe, the police didn't believe that story one bit. <laughs> They, they wanted, you know, they're like, well, how'd you get here? Well, we came on the big yellow canoe out in the yard there. We, we're, we're from Canada. And I was like, no, no, don't worry. I have my passport. So I go to the case where we kept the passports, and I open it up, and sure enough, right underneath the passports was the gun that had been given to us. <gasps> oh, great. And so oh the police God. are like, well, we're... video? No, well, not that's why I was saying uh, not everything makes it into Holy cow. Uh, Let me the just TV stop show. Stop you, officer, for a sec while I grab out my camera. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah, exactly. They wouldn't have liked that too much. We wow. tried to get as much as we possibly could into the yeah. series, and there are some fantastical uh, uh, um, stories in the show. But you should do enactments as well. Like this is the true, and this is the enactment of the true yeah. story. Wow, exactly. that's exactly. amazing. Yeah. yeah, so it was a incredible adventure. I mean, the, the first season, you know, these guys were, you know sleeping in men's washrooms under bridges. It was a real survival type story that, uh, you know, we're just glad that people have, you know, a real Canadian following has uh, gone behind it. So it's cool. You, you know, I'm just curious because I wonder when, uh, if you're, when you're taking a canoe trip down a, a in civilization, like yeah. not up north somewhere, but you know, where, where do you camp? Do you just camp on a farmer's field or do you go into town and talk to people or? What we'd researched beforehand, by law, um, it says in the United States that uh, the government owns all land uh, right up to the high water mark. So if you're going down a river and you could see traces of wherever the water had touched, yeah. then apparently nobody's allowed to own that land right. and it is public land so you're allowed to camp there. But we always made a point to go and if we're on somebody's land, we could see somebody's house to like try and go and see them, knock on their doors, say, look, you know, uh, if you don't mind, we're just going to camp down by the river. And okay. Anybody ever refuse you, Brian? Nobody ever refuses. Most of the time, they just wanted us to come in and hang out with them. They're like, well, don't wow. camp. Like, come come have a hot meal. And uh, Well, at least it wasn't wow. criminals putting a gun in your face. It was actually the police. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. And I was just going to say, uh, actually, uh, you said we, you know, we didn't run into much trouble with that uh, in the first season, but the but second, second season, season. Uh, they just did the entire Colorado River uh, from <laughs> basically Denver all the way down to, uh, to Yuma, which is right on the border of uh, Mexico. So uh, they, where they were battling cold, uh, you know, when they were doing the Mississippi, now they're battling 100 degree weather every single day down the Colorado. And where they were able to camp on the shores, you'll see in the first episode of the second season, um, this one rancher uh, didn't uh, like that we were launching uh, our canoe uh, on his uh -huh. property and actually called the police. Again. Uh, yeah. And we almost were arrested yeah. uh, the first, in the <laughs> first episode of the second season. Okay, so. I have to ask you about the Colorado River. Yeah. So you were, is that upriver from uh, the Hoover Dam? Yeah. So you had to portage around the dam yes. kind of thing. <laughs> and then you got white water, don't you? Yeah. Like that absolutely. like heavy white water. Yeah. We were actually lucky this year because it was the driest that it's been in twenty years on the Colorado River. So a lot of the rapids that we hit were a little bit easier. Yeah. Uh, but also more dangerous for the canoe because there's more rock showing and we, we yeah. put some definite dings. Like, did you have to s out outfit the canoe special, like to keep the water out and, and that sort of thing? The canoe's bulletproof. Yeah. So, yeah. What is it? Is it one of those Kevlar canoes? Yeah, uh, it's an yeah. uh, ultralight Kevlar. Okay, and does yeah. it need to be bulletproof? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, pretty much, because we, we hit a lot of rocks and a lot of other things. I mean, it doesn't need to be bulletproof for, for bullets as much, but... Uh, and how long was, was it? I asked that question. How long was the canoe? Uh, it's 20 feet. 20, 20 feet. feet? 20, yeah. feet uh, 20 foot Mackenzie canoe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and how much does that weigh? Just curious. Uh, well, that one, that's why we went with the ultralight Kevlar, because that one only weighs 80 pounds. Yeah. Which, okay. I mean, you can easily put on your shoulders and, and portage yourself if, you, if needs be. You know? There's but a lot of different materials that canoes can be made of. And uh, is Kevlar the best material, in your opinion, or does it, it depend it on the application? It really depends on the application. Like, okay. going down the Colorado River, we would have probably been better in, uh, in a Royal X canoe, mm -hmm. which is um, uh, what they use for whitewater uh, kayaking and whitewater canoes. Mm -hmm. And it's just even more bulletproof than, than Kevlar. <laughs> it's uh, mm -hmm. that much sturdier, but we kind of wanted to do the, the trip with the same canoe that we, mm -hmm. we started with. You know? Were there any moments uh, in the Colorado where you thought you might uh, not <laughs> make it to shore? <laughs> oh, there was, yeah, there was quite a few of those, uh, those moments. Uh, there was definitely some, some points as we're going down the rapids and, 
you keep looking and going, oh my god, uh, I don't this, know if this was a this good is idea. It. This is it for us. <laughs> this is it. These guys yeah. are, were doing up to uh, class four rapids, yeah. uh, which is can get pretty hairy even for a kayaker. So, wow. uh, in a 20 foot canoe with 600 plus pounds of gear uh, strapped to it, and two guys that are. <laughs> are battling heat exhaustion and uh, you know other elements is pretty crazy. I remember there was one one story that keeps coming to mind. We were coming out of the Grand Canyon and um, one of the kayakers, you know, tried to get them to stop, and uh, it was actually it was too late to. We were gonna they were gonna hit the rapids regardless. They went through them, thankfully got through, and then we found out later that uh, two canoers uh, had actually gone down these rapids a few days ago and they hadn't found the bodies yet. Uh, wow. So it, it was, you know, we, we, I feel, got lucky a lot of the times. Uh, we were basically <laughs> running gunning, uh, wow. especially with the production of it and, you know, with the, with these guys, you know, just being able to, you know, be the, the, the you know, the talented canoers that they are and, and, uh, and get through some pretty hairy situations, which is all miraculously caught on camera in the second mm -hmm. season. We had, you know, a lot more cameras. We had GoPros on all over the cameras. We had GoPros on GoPros, yeah, we were yeah. used to say. And, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, obviously, Claude, my co-producer, very talented uh, camera op as well. And, um, you know, we just some wow. of the some of the shots in the second season are just unbelievable. So there would be a big difference between the second season and the first season. Oh, then. It's, yeah. It's so is that what's airing now? The second season. Yeah. Second series airing now. It's uh, Mondays at uh, 10 p.m. on Travel and Escape. Uh, Rogers, it's uh, channel 267, and uh, Bell, it's channel 527. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Mondays at 10. If you want to check it out, um, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Great. And uh, and uh, so, what about season three? What do you got in mind for that? Oh well, you guys have been toying with go the Amazon. Riding. We've no? been to yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just surprised that both the Bryans are, you know, still surviving. You know, <laughs> want to do what you guys yeah. want to do? Uh, you oh, should pick yeah. a more and more dangerous yeah. river each exactly. <laughs> season. <laughs> well, you can follow these guys actually uh, at uh, Palling Bryans on Twitter, and we are taking suggestions for the third wow, season. Wow, very cool. Um, Maybe you should have a contest. Yeah, well, that that would be it. I mean, we'd obviously uh, we'd love to hear suggestions. We're huh. we're definitely, you know, obviously our minds are on third season now. Uh, the Amazon through Brazil has been mentioned. Uh, well, the you get Rhine to really River. travel too. How how cool is that? The Rhine right? through Europe would be amazing. And uh, oh my god, Danube. we just we'd like to leave yeah, North America Danube. and get out there a bit. Yeah. Well, that, that that's basically it. And me and Brian have always been saying that in, even TV show or not, like this is what we love to do. And I mean, we're we're going to keep going on different adventures down different rivers, whether or not there's going to be a TV show. It's just man, if you can it's make a bonus a, if everybody else can see it. If you, you know? can make a career out of this and just keep it going, and <laughs> you know, amazing. the Nile I think would be amazing oh, from Lake Nile Victoria be all the way to the Mediterranean would be awesome. You, if we do the Nile, you win the contest. Okay. You can come with us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Wow. Sit in the middle. Beautiful. There's That's lots of room four. there. Season oh, there's four. Yeah. There's tons. Season four. <laughs> okay. So 600 pounds. Um, uh, yeah. Beer? Yes. Okay, yeah. So that beer must weigh a lot. The beer. <laughs> no, yeah. the beer is easy because the beer, you know, it starts off heavy and then you just finish it, right? And <laughs> but it's <laughs> we, we, we take, again, no, no, but we take cans, we crush They're them. Cans. You know, it's very nice. And gotta be cans. A really cool fact, actually, is uh, you know, uh, with all the water in the world, only one percent of it is fresh water. And uh, you know, being able to do this, the two rivers that we already have. I mean, we're on our way. We want to do it all. Yeah, we want to do all that one percent. Wow, that's amazing. Exactly. Great. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay. My, my goal one success, day guys. maybe to do Antarctica because there's some there's some crazy uh, there's some crazy little rivers in Antarctica that have just never been nuts. touched before, <laughs> and nobody's ever put a canoe in. So, do they I mean, flow even? Uh, only for like three weeks wow. of the year. Yeah. Wow. I mean, yeah, that would, that would be, be very. That would be down the line. Maybe insane. by then all the ice will be gone. You, anyway. you, <laughs> you, yeah. you need to read Donna's book, yeah. How to Talk to Crazy People, because mm -hmm. you are insane. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely, yeah. Well, I'll buy, I might have to buy that book, being the producer, one of the yeah. <laughs> Okay, guys. Well, this has been awesome. Yeah. And uh, Thank you guys I wish for you sharing you, that experience. Amazing. I wish you all the best yeah. and yeah. Uh, yeah, want to hear nice. about next season. So, Monday night, 10 o'clock on uh, 267 on Rogers, 527 on Bell, and uh, thanks for coming in today, guys. Wow, thanks. Thank thanks, you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank okay. you, guys. Awesome. All right, well. Uh, now we go to something more serious. We do, we got Graham and Monica. We're gonna talk about uh, relationships, and I have a video that'll set us up nicely of, of a UFO going into a volcano. Okay, there's a relationship. Okay, and that 
I'm sure Monica has some insight on what is going on here. What's the relationship between a UFO and a volcano? I don't know. It's just the video I have ready okay. to go. Okay. <laughs> so let's watch this. We'll come back with Graham and Monica okay. Burweiss right They'll after make this. sense of it for us. Tranquilos hasta ayer por la tarde cuando registró una fuerte exhalación. Pero tras la exhalación se registró algo que no sé qué sea. No sé cómo explicarlo. Vamos a verlo, vamos a verlo juntos. Miren lo que cae en el, en el cráter. Esta es la exhalación. Y luego es esto. Ahí está esto que cae en el cráter. Ante esto no se lo presenté ayer porque buscamos especialistas que hasta hoy nos dieron estas explicaciones. Mire. Estas son imágenes captadas por la cámara de Televisa ubicada en el cerro Alzomoni, muy cerca del volcán Popocatépetl. Según especialistas, se trata de un objeto de aproximadamente un kilómetro de largo por 200 metros de ancho. No se puede apreciar de dónde viene pero con una velocidad mayor a la de un avión, pareciera que entra al cráter. Así se ve de cerca. Es un cuerpo cilíndrico, se aprecia un exceso de brillo en su cara frontal y una sombra. Acudimos con la astrónoma de la UNAM y miembro de la Unión Astronómica Internacional que ha revisado a detalle los objetos luminosos vistos en la zona hace 15 días y en abril pasado, cuando el volcán registró mayor actividad. Una cosa interesante en todo esto es que va en caída. Sería todavía más espectacular si fuera en su vida. ¿eh? Cuando es algo que va cayendo, como que hay más causas naturales que cuando va subiendo. Descartó que fuera material incandescente lanzado por el volcán y que regresa en caída libre, debido a que no se aprecia un camino de luz trazado por el cuerpo en movimiento. Misma situación que descarta la posibilidad de que sea un meteorito. Llama la atención de los astrónomos ciertas características de este objeto. Por un lado, que tenga una línea bien definida, que los bordes sean brillantes y de diferentes colores, pero sobre todo que no se aprecie la interacción con la atmósfera ni con los gases del volcán. Imagínense un cilindro de un kilómetro de largo y de 200 metros de ancho. O sea, dos calles de ancho y un kilómetro de largo en una zona donde hay, aparte de la atmósfera terrestre, pues están todas estas exhalaciones, gases y todo caliente. Se esperaría un fenómeno explosivo, como más gases, humo, una luz diferente y sonido. Nada se ve ni se escucha. La especialista aseguró que incluso puede tratarse de un defecto del video que muchos de los píxeles de la imagen están saturados. Entonces, como que fuera un rayón o algo, como que pareciera que no es parte del video original. Una sola imagen para los científicos, dijo la astrónoma, no es suficiente para hacer una sí. aseveración. Ajá. Es un fenómeno interesante, hay que estar atentos pero se necesita confirmación. Sara y Méndez, Noticieros Televisa. Bueno, lo vimos ahora en cámara lenta. Así es como lo, lo registró nuestra cámara que está ahí permanentemente. No, eso es en cámara lenta. Así lo registró exactamente así. Bien, entonces este es el registro original. Bueno, el, el fin de semana buscaremos mayores explicaciones con especialistas. All right. Sí, so the, the, did you see that UFO go into the volcano, Sandra? It's, it did. It's weird. It went into the volcano. Did it come back out? No. Wow, it's like I, the Bermuda Triangle. Right? The, the best I can think of is that the <laughs> aliens, or whoever they are, are... are putting something in there to make sure that the volcano, which is a big one in Mexico, doesn't blow and, and kill them. Oh, so they're people. good guys. These are good aliens. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. Okay. But we have uh, Graham and Monica Burweiss here, guys. And uh, Hello. great to have you on the show. <laughs> I and, to be and we I'm are, scared. I'm anticipating what? right now because you are up to something. <laughs> no, I'm not. I don't even know what I'm going to say next. <laughs> I know. Exactly. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> like before we came here, we were like, 
what are we going to talk about this today? Uh, talk about today? I go, I don't know of those two guys. Uh, let's just not prepare. <laughs> well, 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 I mean, sort of when I asked you before, you said, because well, I know you just put on that seminar about relationships, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe we're going to get into some of that. I'm sure we are. But let's just keep it open. And Graham, you said this morning, we were talking about the Mercury going retrograde, retrograde. today. And, and you, you kind of had a thought or, or a, a feeling this morning, Graham, that there's some energetic shift happening? Well, <clears throat> I mean, apart from the, you know, apart from the in the moment stuff, you know, Mercury going retrograde, I'm sure most people who are even remotely sensitive to energy can feel there's something going on. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, it has anything to do with December 21st? Do you think maybe it's a lead up? Because we're not that far away. Yeah, I think. <clears throat> You know what I'm, f what I'm sort of sensing is that there's definitely a, a build up to something, and uh, you know a lot of people are feeling that uh, something's going to happen. Nobody's really sure what it's going to look like or what it is, or even you know what. Could could it have anything to do with the U.S. election? Because <coughs> there's a lot of. Um uneasiness around that too well well you want to say something i, I think it's the other like way around the election is kind of falling into that energetic shift maybe, and a lot right. of things yeah. will will happen during that we probably won't know about that that well that's going to be a little bit different than usually so it's yeah, the well, energy first and that the election yeah, is I a byproduct so because remember what franco said even that even mm -hmm. if it doesn't matter who gets elected everything could shift in an instant these days but who knows because i'm actually getting the vibe maybe <laughs> because maybe i'm squashing all my feelings and my vibes but i'm getting the vibe that it's been a v actually a very calm year and maybe that, and, and maybe maybe nothing's going to happen, or maybe the aliens or whoever they are, are acting. You know, they're putting those suppositories into the <laughs> volcanoes, and maybe they're just making sure that everything's going to be okay. Where have you been? You <laughs> maybe he was with those guys kayaking and yes. drinking beer. Yes, <laughs> everything nice. I and have calm. drunk a beer. Or so. So, so you don't think it's been a calm year, is what you're saying? Well, I think it is going to be perceived by each individual differently, and I think it's very difficult to talk really what is going to happen be because although the energetic shifts are going to happen, mm -hmm. everyone mm -hmm. is going to uh, respond to it differently because, as we covered at one of our interviews, at before we kind of evolved on a um, global level and then it became like a societal and community and family now it's very individual evolution going right going on so i think everyone is going to um to experience that differently and for just like five gum that's deep can you explain Tastes different to all of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I've never tried it. I'll have to try it. Just watch the commercials. Okay. Um, you know what? You know, <laughs> you're right though, Monica, about the perception thing because he said this year has been mm -hmm. pretty smooth, and I thought, what are you talking about? We just mm -hmm. had Hurricane Sandy, Big which deal. is considered for us. It's a windy night. Yeah, in Toronto, but talk to people in New York, and they'll tell you their 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 you know their life was pretty much shattered. It's going to take you know a long time to fix a lot of what was you know, happened there. So I think it, uh, like you said, Monica, I think it depends mm -hmm. on perception and where we are Absolutely. in, in uh, the world. Level of our evolution and- And our awareness, yeah. And sort of our contract that we have here to fulfill. Now we've been very lucky here in Canada from a geographical perspective, but again, that probably is not on per, not, is by design as well. We've, we're here for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. Because we don't need to have that kind of earth shake, rattle and roll in our life. Right. Uh, that, that's for sure true. But I, what I wanted to say, based on that individual kind of journey of the evolution, what is happening with us, we, we need to remember that as a part of a consciousness, consciousness is made of energy and information. And each of us is a different piece of that information. So we contain a different information uh, kind of embedded in us. So we'll process that piece of that information on that energetic level to kind of 
make the universe expand and and it it, it is a time for the universe to expand itself like exponentially rather than gradually as it was happening for the past 5,000 years. So we're nothing more than a computer chip, really. Well, An emotional computer chip, maybe. I think, you know, there, there's, a, there's a variety of perspectives to take on that uh, thing. In the really big picture, our function in the universe seems to be processing information, sure. But at the same time, we're all conscious and aware individual people and uh, you know from an individual perspective I'd say it's more about learning to have fun to enjoy your life and make the most of that and uh, you know the same as same as the how we react to other things it's different looks different for everyone so you know you'll get somebody who really enjoys the outdoors like these two guys we we heard from just now and uh, you know they'll while make it they're their, having fun their life mission to to do that and then you'll get other people who are um, sort of looking more at how things work and, and what's going on in the world and f for myself and Monica you know we're really having fun when we're sharing with with other people you know that's that's really what what drives so, me. so do you help other people to realize having fun in their life? Is that? I think. You know, I think. <clears throat> because it's hard to say, yeah, I'm having fun if you know I just lost my job or mm. I'm going through a divorce. That's the individual choice whether you have the fun or not. Mm. I think it's it's not for me so much about fun as about helping people to just understand mm -hmm. the processes that they're going through, and just the understanding of what's really going on underneath what what it looks like on the surface to the persona um, gives people a greater sense of peace and you know ability to just deal with it okay so uh, let's <coughs> let's get into something here because we're talking about a, a possible shift certainly an anticipated mm -hmm. shift as the mind Back to the calendar mm -hmm. comes to an end and let's talk about because you guys just put on a seminar about relationships. Let's talk about how relationships ties into the shift. Yeah, or and if you have any insights about that. And I know you Does guys it even maybe yeah. 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 Well I think you know this shift <coughs> involves many different levels. You know, if we're looking at the entire human race mm -hmm. and the level of consciousness we're accessing that's one whole arena of it. The other arena is your personal experience of it. And you know, as, <clears throat> as things shift, as we go through this transformation everyone's talking about, um, any, any unsolved problems you have, any erroneous beliefs that are keeping you stuck, and these things are gonna come up and the challenges we face are going to become more and more severe in an effort to try and push us beyond these these issues. And one of the places where <coughs> growth is most fundamentally present is relationships. You know, for many people, <coughs> relationships are considered to be about companionship and about uh, being loved by somebody. And but fundamentally, relationships are really about growth. They're about each individual that's involved. It's about the, dyn the, well, the dynamics are present in, in relationships, which pushes you forward at the maximum possible rate. And this is why people are finding so much problems, so many issues in relationships in the last couple of years. Um, almost every second person I talk to has had problematic relationships that they're running from or well it all started with Henry the eighth <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know we we went from a society with zero divorce it was absolutely illegal forbidden by the church to Henry the eighth was, was the first and now at least 50 percent of marriages are well are ending you, in divorce. you've got to take that in in context and realize that the church institutionalized marriage in the first place. 
Mm -hmm. They made it a legal binding contract. Mm -hmm. Before that, it was a person's everyday choice. Mm -hmm. yeah, you I got mean, together that, that with someone. That is even hard to conceive of that marriage the idea of marriage didn't doesn't exist or didn't exist. That almost seems like it was something we were born with. You know, it's funny to think that we had to actually well, create that. Well, I, it's it's far older than that. It, it existed for a long time before that, but it was never really uh, a contract. It was never really binding by law. Okay. Previously, you know, and there was no institution before that that really made made it legally binding, something that you couldn't get out of. You know, somebody told, made an interesting comment interesting. to me within the last week, too, that uh, divorce is really a, uh, something that a prosperous society can afford. If, if you're, not, if you're mm -hmm. in a very, uh, not, you know, if, you, if you're struggling on a day-to-day -day level just to, you know, grow enough food to keep yourself going, Divorce really isn't an option. It's like, you know, you, you, you find a life partner and you're too busy working and she's too busy uh, looking after the, the home fires uh, that, uh, you know, you, uh, you have to maintain that team that's working together, you know, to, to survive. Well, and that's very, very good on, a, on, a, on that very surface level. But like, I, like it's, it's very funny, I have so much to say about what is be going behind the scenes. And I can see how our language is so limiting that I don't even know how to start without giving the wrong impression that that is how it is. Yes. Because what happens really when two people get into a relationship, and intimate relationship uh, specifically, uh, e each, of, each of a person has uh, their own uh, uh, vortex, kind of. Okay. When they get together, a third vortex is, is being created. Now, you mean an energy? It, it, for the sake of the conversation, we'll say the energy vortex is okay. being created. It, it's created, and it's really well. I would suggest to uh, read a book, um, Buber's book, I and Thou, how the relationships are being really formed on the on a deep level because what we are when we are getting into relationships what mm -hmm. what we cover is usually the physical attraction and how they look how they're a able to make a living whether they are at a certain level of uh, development as we are at least Education, within a income and all of ranch, that how yeah. the family background and and that's really what what brings people together they they scan only that surface and they don't really know how it, what is happening behind the scene and the, the relationship has the capacity to survive only in a sense, only in a situation when those two people are equally involved in the vortex. Okay. okay. Other, otherwise, that vortex is not going to happen, that third vortex. Okay. What happens with okay. the third vortex? Both people exponentially grow because that third which is created is not it's only those two people, but also it's something. Uh, created other than okay okay, okay. and so the, the divorces well, what was happening with the w with the shift with the energy shift first we got to understand that we are just not the body behind the scenes we have a certain connections with the universe and our biggest strain uh, like like it's like a strain but it's a connection with the universe is our assemblage point and our assemblage point is usually being located in a in a specific spa place when when we come to when he, we are he's being taking born. Notes. I know it, it's very difficult to explain, and I don't want to be like mm. wrong well, about this because it's so like it, there is no words really to yet at least I didn't find it. That's why. I, just make faces, Monica. I'm, I'm making faces. That's why I'm making faces. Because you know what? We can, instead of having it, I just want to have the meditation and just send the I energy just want to be as correct get as with the observations that I learn over the years as possible. So that assemblage point is located in one space. Most of the time, uh, within our lifetime, it doesn't have a chance to move. And uh, mm. that's, that is one of the reasons why uh, people find themselves m through their lifetime going through the same kind of set of uh, experiences, issues. Okay. Yeah. issues, whatever one, one will be do, uh, dealing with money, perhaps relationships, maybe inner conflict, maybe fear, maybe self-esteem issue, whatever. And it, most likely it's not going to change until the assemblage point is going to change. Okay, what 
Sorry. Hold on, hold on. I'm on okay. a go, on a, on a roll. On a roll. So when those two people get together and that third vortex is created, that could be a possibility for the assemblage point to move. Ah, but because it is okay. so severe for people and they don't even realize why, they get out of the relationship ASAP. Okay. And uh, because everything is kind of changing and shifting nowadays, it's being a little bit more rapid and a little bit more drastic. Okay. So okay. people are incapable of dealing with that on, on the energetic level. They think it's like because you don't respect me, because you don't love me, because you don't. Uh, so they I dress don't it know, up with seriously. the surface type issues that you were talking about but, earlier. But this is such a surface uh, understanding that it really doesn't solve anything. Because you go somewhere else, it will be the same thing uh, in a different relationship. So people are really not dealing with the relationships per se, but, but with their personal evolution. And it's all because they're avoiding this assemblage point. Good job, Monica. There you go. Okay, so first, we, we had somebody on the show uh, that was doing something with assemblage points. Uh, I can't remember. I have no, I don't I know. know. So you don't even know what that is? No. Right, uh, and was, I'm not sure. That's another sure. thing I need and to look wanna, into again. I'm, I'm not even Monica sure what it was. But Monica, can you, what is an assemblage point? Hmm. Well, it, it's sort of like a, our... Mm, our second body, but not in the body sense, the, the physical body sense. It's mm -hmm. like our storage of information and our connection with that field of information that, 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 that we process our beingness through. And how, so like an how etheric body make? or something, okay. right? Maybe? N no, it, it's, not, it's not just that, no. Okay. How does it manage, okay, it's not, is it, is it an actual body? Like is it? Is there another? No, it's a, it's a it's a size of a a little bit bigger than a grapefruit, and I was going to say grapefruit. Because because we established this on the last show that you already you started to meet, read minds. Oh. Okay. You remember the intranet versus ah, the internet? Yes, that's right. Thank you. Yes. I don't remember. See so you tuning in. See, well, except he only he selectively. It. Yes, in tune it. That's what you yes. said. He selectively does that. And usually it, uh, well, I'm not 100% sure whether in all instances it appears above the head, but uh, it is about mm, half a foot to a foot. So it's an actual energetic body. It's an energy sink. Okay. 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 So let's not get into the details about yes, that. Yes. Let's talk about relationships, how it affects the relationships, because what you said, how does it manifest? correct me, is that people, they're dealing with their own issues, so they may move on to a different relationship, mm -hmm. but the dynamics of that relationship often might be very similar to the last relationship because they haven't dealt with their own issues. Well, because ultimately you can't run from yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, that assemblage point is always there. Wherever mm -hmm. you go, well, you have the assemblage point is just an energetic sort of. Uh, you know, some people view it as the seat of the soul. Oh, it's, I've heard it's, that phrase. It's our, yeah, it's it's our energetic connection to the rest of the, the universe. Uh, okay. It's. Uh, yeah. yeah. I just want to add about the assemblage point and about what is happening with the around us with the universe with the shift. It, its purpose is to actually force the assemblage point to move, because oh. we were unable to move through our evolution that assemblage point by ourselves. So it, every like we are experiencing ah. difficult situations in our life or dramatic situations on li uh, in our lives and. Uh, a lot of divorces, a lot of car accidents. I mm -hmm. notice a lot mm -hmm. of people fell ill mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. recently, and like really weird stuff are happening to people. Mm -hmm. But in order for that assemblage point to move, you either have like enough personal power to do that yourself, or you have to be jolted through a certain experience, and then there is that possibility of that happening. And, and and that's why like the universe is almost pressing on itself to evolve farther, and it will bring up a certain pressure pressure Especially. to 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 get you to, to move. 
do yeah. its job. So the for pressure is manifested in life situations like relationships yeah. or jobs v or whatever. Very much. It Definitely. takes the form of our dynamics, yeah. Okay. So, so you had mentioned that we couldn't do it ourselves for most of us. So mm -hmm. we're getting a jolt, or we're getting assistance, mm -hmm. assistance from outside of us. What do you mean by that? <laughs> Very good question. Okay. Well, the, mm, we we are living in a holographic universe. Everything on the outside is inside. Inside there is outside. no such a thing the outside and the inside and that's where we <laughs> fall a little bit uh, incorrect on the same like understanding of God where is God is it outside is it inside whether people are doing something to us whether life is happening to us or is it really how we process the information that we are uh, creating this we are having as our makeup to reflect that on the outside okay. so it, it's it's a little bit difficult to to say how how that process works because I, I know a bit I'm still learning this okay. is such a difficult well, you know good for you for, for for knowing and saying okay this is a bigger issue than I can yeah. describe or explain mm -hmm. but but the bottom line is you are saying it's something beyond our ability to know to deal with for some of us beyond so we're getting our assistance ability to process yes okay so we're getting assistance by way of forcing us to kind of change things through the <coughs> events that are happening in our life that would be pretty correct and with the relationships again what's what is messing up with that a little bit is the fact that we are using only the the, the senses what we know that one percent of the things that are available to us and what happened when mm. we met with Graham, that we really never go into depth uh, during our interviews because it's, it's, it's really that kind of subject. So we kind of actually felt that vortex opening, that third vortex, because we were equally involve, involved and pretty much on the same evolutional scale, we opened the vortex and we could feel it. How it you mean between the two of you? Yes. Okay. W okay. When we f when we first because met. you are a couple. So just to make that clear, you are a couple. Absolutely. As well as partner, business partners, or spiritual. and so what happened is we didn't see each other and we were not around each other. We were on the exact opposite sides of the globe. Yet that vortex was very uh, powerful. We could mm. sense it. We could mm. feel it. Uh, we were pretty much high for about four months, and. Uh, Thank goodness that we were not around each other because it could burst us to pieces. That's how it felt. So wow, we had a that's chance so powerful. to process certain information and kind of upgrade to the level that we needed to, we were able to function together. Okay. And in that vortex, in that space of beyond our reason, we were able to pass by space and time even we had those moments when it was possible wow that's so neat so it was quite a quite a journey quite a so, journey so so when you guys finally did because you were in south africa correct that's right correct right, yeah. okay so when you finally did hook up personally mm -hmm. within each other's space mm -hmm. for the first time mm -hmm. what did that feel like well at first uh we kind of thankfully got busy with uh preparing for the wedding because we we met and we had four days to the wedding so wow. we kind of got distracted but the moment we settled down you remember honey we went to the cottage and we were able to just chill out there for a couple days I can't even explain what was happening it I, I was in such a space that I was crying and laughing I was losing like I was wow, losing my mind I didn't know what the heck is going on with me and do you remember that? Yeah, processing a lot of stuff. I, I, I thought I'm going rapid cuckoo. Rapid <laughs> like Again, seriously. how to talk to crazy people. Donna's book keeps coming up. I'm kidding. That, um, it, because that's well, what that's, you must have felt like. You must have felt like you were crazy. Absolutely. I, I, uh, it was not a feeling that, not a usual feeling that my senses were able to identify with wow. before. So it, but it was very toxic and very difficult to process, very, very. So we were processing it for about six months, I think. 
to to even be quite okay with. <laughs> and same experience for you, Graham? Um, I think I had a little bit of a calmer experience. No kidding. Look at the uh, look. At, I, I can't <laughs> even imagine you getting overjoyed or excited because you are, you have this calm demeanor that is just so. So. Almost, I, almost, but it's it's. I mean, it, there's just so you're just so centered. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, yes. do I just I have think to finish that thought? It's okay. The reason for that is, you know, I've spent most of my life understanding these processes that we're going through and you know one of the things that is central to that is where the emotions fit in with that how they function and you know emotion is basically when you feel an emotion whether it's positive or negative mm -hmm. it's an it's an indicator of how accurate your perception of reality is so if you're perceiving reality to be, you know, ultimately things are always just what they are. There's no really good or bad. Um, and everything contains for each person elements of positive and negative things, you know. So there'll be advantages and disadvantages mm -hmm. to everything. So if we view things and we, we get into this what they call judgment, mm -hmm. and, you know, we're perceiving more positive than negative or more negative than positive you have an emotional reaction to that and the emotional reaction is actually trying to tell you that your perception is skewed so I spent a lot of time looking at that and understanding that process and what happens is you get into the habit over time of learning to manage your perception so when you see things mm. and you start to become triggered you know what's going on so instead of being invested in your emotional state, you're invested in yourself at a far deeper level. Mm. And that just, you know, you have that sense of peace. And I think, you know, spiritually, that's what they're talking about. You could be standing in the middle of a war zone and you can still feel that inner peace because you're at a level of, of seeing and understanding <laughs> that is just but does, so that, does that mean you're not feeling anything, Graham, or does that mean you feel more and you just don't attach? Well, feelings and emotions are distinctly different. You know, um, you can have feelings that are totally devoid of emotion, and okay. we've all had that experience. So we get confused between feelings and emotions a lot of the time, and it's, it's important to make that distinction. And sure, I have a lot of feelings. I just don't have uh, huge emotional swings anymore because it's kind of become a habit for me to review my perception until I can make sense of it enough that it's not a big charge. Wow, Guys, that's listen. Amazing. Yeah, I mean we could talk all day, but <laughs> guess what? I mean we've Time's up? Our time's almost oh up. Oh my gosh. But you guys, I mean, you guys sound, and I just want to ask you very briefly, if you can just, because uh, you guys uh, obviously have an uh, amazing relationship, and I know there's a big story behind it, but what can you uh, 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 recommend to people, p uh, to couples? A, lo a lot of couples, I don't know who's got a perfect relationship, but is it Graham, and maybe we'll start with you, and then we'll get something from Monica, but just very briefly. Like in, I, and I know it's unfair, but maybe in 30 seconds. 30 what seconds. Do you, what can you tell to, to people who are in relationship <laughs> that are trying to deal with their uh, situation? I think the important thing to understand is, you know, very much there's a misconception of the whole concept of love. And really, to truly love somebody, I mean really at a deep level, only starts to occur when you understand how that person has been instrumental in your process of growth. And then, and then when growth, do people grow apart and then they have to go find another partner? Or is that a cop-out? I think, you know, in, in most cases that's a case of where people are trying to avoid the specific challenges they're supposed to be dealing with individually mm -hmm. and they'll just replace it somewhere else. Okay. So, uh, but on the other hand you do get cases mm -hmm. where somebody is actively engaged in their personal growth yeah and the other partner is not particularly actively engaged in fact they're trying in a sense to remain juvenile they're trying mm -hmm. to not grow it's they're not trying to growth. stay who they are and I know then some people like that you do you kind of you, you get to a point where you grow apart 
okay. where this person can no longer serve you in terms of functionally pushing you to grow anymore. Okay. So it becomes stagnant. All right. Okay. Monica, I don't uh, we're going to have to just get something very briefly for you, and then we're going to tell seconds. people how to get in touch with you guys. So. Okay, so two seconds. Like, w what came to me is like basically because in the relationship, especially, it's very evident that we are basing everything on the past. And we're forget forgetting that it's all about the present moment and how we build up to the moment. We are completely a new species. And I remember when I asked Graham uh, when we met, I'm like, honey, how do you know it's going to last forever? <laughs> like, seriously, we don't even yes. know each other. And, and and I, you know, my, my reasoning mind, of course, kicked in. And he said, honey, it's not about building it up for a lifetime. It is waking up every morning and making that decision fresh. And I think if people were able to start Excuse from where they are today and being centered and looking at the situation, what can I do today? That would look completely different as well. Not looking back. Beautifully, beautifully okay. put. Just w before you find out more information, maybe next time we can talk a little bit about emotions versus feelings sure. and go into that kind of. Discussion. And you guys do more than just relationships as well. Yeah. You do all. Right. You do everything. So how do people get in touch with you guys? Uh, best way is to uh, find us on our website at Global. Uh, awakeninginstitute.com. We have amazing tools in there, a lot of information. What I would suggest to check out is our blog. We do talk uh, a lot about uh, emotions and our spiritual evolution, our personal growth. So we have a lot of very amazing articles in there. Uh, you can also subscribe to our free master tools and nice. you can just sign um, f at the web on the website and you can also find us on the mm. Facebook under Global Awakening Institute fan page. Fantastic. I'm on that fan page. Okay. Mm -hmm. All yeah, right. What, guys, what we try and do this. is we really try and make all this information practically applicable for people because that's important. Yeah. You know, it's one thing to talk about it. It's yeah. another thing to actually make it a part of you and your life. Right. That's the challenge. Okay, guys. Thanks for coming in today. Thank Look you. forward Thank to you. next time. It was a great chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to watch a little video just to prove that perpetual motion machines are real and they actually work. <laughs> okay? Because a lot of people think it can't happen, but it can happen. We're going to watch this video. I come don't back. know what that is. Sean Dalton's going to be on the show. I don't know if Joe's going to join us, but uh, Liquid Lunch continues right after this. Joe is in the house.
back to the show here and uh, we'll hitting the home stretch hit. as you say absolutely so uh, we're Trying here with well. Sean Dalton and Sean great to have you back on the show as always thanks for having me here now what are we talking today we're talking about in pursuit of the Canadian dream okay I don't know what that is it's economic is okay. it yeah it's not like that Nickelback video it could be okay it could, it could be. be the Canadian Nickelback's Canadian a great uh, example of a successful Canadian band who have sold tens of millions of CDs here and in the States. Have they actually been on Cribs yet? Chad, my oh. hero, Chad Kroger. What's Cribs? It's a show about stars. I talked to oh. a lot of Canadians that don't like uh, homegrown talent. I'm going to yeah. get to that in, I know. in a minute. We got a problem with our culture. We, we do. don't. We, we, don't. Do. we, we don't hate ourselves. Our there's a, there's a That's right. We do. I was just talking to somebody yeah. about that yesterday. Okay, so. Sean, go. Sad. Okay. Um, Small Business Week celebrates Canadian entrepreneurial achievements. Uh, this was an article published by the Epoch Times in the business section on A9 between October 18th and 24th of this year. Yeah. Okay. And it says, a key problem to address is Canada's lagging productivity due to too little investment in business productivity, such as new electronics and machine skills training and development of new products and processes, the bank stated in the fact sheet. That's the Business Development Bank of Canada. It noted that Canada ranks last among G7 countries in investment in advanced machinery and equipment and investment in information and communications technology, or ICT, is especially inadequate. ICT, or Information Communications Technology, accounts for 2.5% of GDP in Canada compared to 3.9% in the US. And from 2008 to 2011, labor productivity growth was negative 0.29% in Canada compared with plus 2.2% in the United States. So mm -hmm. if we had the same productivity as the Americans, each Canadian would have an average of extra $210,000. People have been talking about mm -hmm. lagging Canadian productivity mm -hmm. for at least the right. entire time that I've been okay, aware of this. Okay, but does the fact that we're so nice negate some of that? Yeah. Well, 2011, we're not that nice. 2011 census, only yeah. 5.8 million people chose the I'm a Canadian box. And that was actually an increase Wait, from... Wait, what percent? Of 5.8 million shows the for oh, their identity under oh. the census. Which so, is one six, right? Because about the yeah, like almost it's less than two out of ten people consider themselves Canadian. So we have a hypertronic, hyphenated mm. identity that divides wow. us into tribes. We're, we're less likely to come together as people to create the opportunities of tomorrow because we're all on different pages. We all speak different languages. Everyone's got different belief systems. There's no core. There's nothing to melt into like in the states where they have the American dream and well, the American I identity. That I, in this article is a big Tim Hortons mug there, Absolutely. and I know everybody drinks Tim Hortons. Not me. Yeah. The, this article is from the um, Epoch Times by Yu Pang. It's called Canadians Trust Homegrown Companies Less Than Global Giants Survey Finds. Wow. Uh, that's our, that's a problem with our culture. We've always been like that. Canadians may feel sentimental about homegrown brands, but they trust and respect them less than the Global Giants of Survey has found. Yeah. Only six of the top 60 multinational brands as chosen by Canadians are Canadian. And the highest rated Canadian company on the list, Quebec pharmacy chain Jean Couteau Group, only managed to reach 29th place. Quote, in general, Canadian, Canadian companies received lower scores than last year, noted the report by international research and communications firms Reputation Institute. Janet Hanna, vice president of Trajectory Reputation Institute's Canadian partner, said these results reinforce the idea that it takes more than being a homegrown to earn support and respect. Quote, Canadian brands have to compete in an international marketplace, even in their own backyard, she said. So. Okay. There are, there are examples of... It is of, tough. It is. It is, but we're not... truth. You know, everyone's in their own little tribe. Instead of coming together to, for unified solidarity... Is yeah, that the real know, problem, though? Wait, 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 wait I mean, Because there doesn't seem to be an issue in Quebec. They seem to be so... Absolutely. Quebec solidarity... Has, that's because it, Quebec has a policy of interculturalism, which means if you have a signage, even Chinese restaurants had to do this, they had to publish their uh, information in French so that... You know, they can still sell Chinese food, but it has to be in French. So they, they share a common, you can understand what they're trying to sell. Well, you can read it. Also it's not in Mandarin. It's not in Cantonese. And you know what? They support you know. their artists. There's they a do. big Absolutely. whole star system that they have there. They, they voted for the NDP. 59 of the 102 seats for the NDP came from Quebec. They vote as a bloc. They vote as a people, as a, as a, as a nation. You know, so we're, maybe the rest of Canada, in terms of what you're saying, the solidarity thing, could learn. We're catching well, up, though. Like, we voted for we? Harper as a, as a nation. He only won five seats in Quebec, right? So that's the first time in 30 years that Quebec was a non-factor in the election. Every wow. prime minister in the last 30 years came from Quebec. Isn't uh, that Trudeau, interesting? Stéphane Dion was from Quebec. Um, Thomas Mulcair, he was in environment minister of Quebec City Liberals. He's running the NDP. Brian Mulroney was from Quebec. Jean Chrétien was from Quebec. Oh, my God. They're all from Quebec, and they all just put Quebec first. And that's why Quebec's been getting more transfer payments than any other province. That's why they're a welfare province. 
Because when they pass a signage law, it's a welfare province. It means they get more transfer payments than than uh, they <sighs> they they get more than they pay into the pot. You know how there's the okay. Uh, well, that's not you know, fair. Well, that's that's Canada for you. We're a we're a you know very tribal country, I guess. This com this company wow. might have. I know you're looking at the glass being half full. Canada Goose, you guys. I mean half empty. You guys heard no, of the Canada Goose Company? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We all know that. Uh, this was written in um, Toronto Business Times, September. Uh, 2012 to 13, Toronto is downtown for Danny Reese, Canada Goose president, CEO firm, to 3,000% growth. That's the name of the, the article. Yeah. It says, wow. more than 50 years ago, Sam Tick started a small garment factory in Toronto called Metro Sportswear. Since 1957, the company has evolved from a small entrepreneurial endeavor to an internationally recognized brand worth over $100 million. Now known as Canada Goose, the company is currently run by Danny Reese, president and CEO of grandson of Sam Tick. By keeping manufacturing in Canada, focusing on a strong business culture, and taking a new approach to marketing, Canada Goose has grown by more than 3,000% as an inspiration to entrepreneurs in Toronto. Um, he said, we are worth over 100 million now. We wow. have grown well over 3,000% in the past 10 years. Internationally, we have grown to the point where people just want more of everything. He said, I, I couldn't believe that people didn't care about Made in Canada, and for us, it was fundamental for our brand. After all, Canada Goose is quintessentially iconic Canadian product. Uh, just like if you made a Swiss watch in China, you can't do that either. We decided that we had to stay in Canada. By making that decision, we have now become the leader of the quote, Made in Canada movement, certainly in the apparel industry, and the poster child for Made in Canada. So Made in Canada was mm -hmm. big for us, that's number one. Being in Toronto made it easier to expand our business internationally. Now two thirds of our business is not done in Canada. A third is in Europe, and a lot in Asia and in the United States. I think that Canada's and Toronto's diversity definitely helped make us grow. That's an so, inspiring story for, yeah. especially for anybody in manufacturing in Canada that wants to keep it Canadian, Absolutely. You know, which is what we need we to do. We have um, business improvement areas in parts of the city. We have like yeah. BIAs. <laughs> there should be like a made in Canada business improvement. There should be, you know. I Something. Fa I, I found another example of a made in Canada clothing company. Okay. You guys ever heard of um, uh, An Antonio Volante? Familiar with them? Tony Valenti? Yeah. I think so. What's Ant the company? Uh, Antonio Valente. This was written in the no, Toronto what? Star Business no. B3 section on Tuesday, October 9, 2012. Okay. The title of the service is called The True North Strong Free and Stylish. Wow. Antonio Valente wants to be a man of the people. The designer is continuing to build his namesake Canadian clothing company while many in the business pack up operations and move abroad. The company's shirts and trousers are imbued with his ethics manufactured in Toronto with a staff paid hourly instead of by volume. The clothier's decision to use a fair payment structure and manufacture locally increased his costs, which is to be expected. His clothing is sold in a hundred, mostly boutique stores throughout North America. Larger retails often import finished products such as shirts, trousers, and suits, duty-free, while Volante has to pay 10 to 20 percent tariff on the raw materials he imports to produce his Canadian-made products. Quote, it increases the price of our shirt, which in turn we have to pass on to our customer, he says. While other costs are directly related to quality, the tariffs add to price tags without increasing value, making his clothing more expensive to make and ultimately cutting into profits by nearly 20 percent per shirt. Volante only charges between 175 and $295 for his products, the same price range as Hugo Boss or Canali. But the profit margin is dramatically different from companies that outsource their labor. Mm. Born to Italian immigrants and infatuated with menswear from a young age, which a lot of Italian people are, mm -hmm. and passed on other things, uh, <laughs> Volante opened his first plant in 2002 and launched the Antoni Volante brand in 2009. As more companies were closing down their manufacturing facilities in Canada, it became increasingly clear to me that we were closing them for the wrong reasons, says Volante, mm. who pays workers 13 to $18 an hour on top of standard health and other benefits, including profit sharing, by the way. Other, quote, other companies wow. don't have those costs, he said, adding that many overseas textile workers only make one or two dollars an hour, which is why they have to work 20 hours a day in China and Hong yeah. Kong and Pakistan and Bangladesh. Volante's factory has 50 clothing makers, about half of which are from Vietnam, while the rest hail from Italy, Greece, and other countries. The designer prides himself on employing many non-English speaking immigrants who have trouble finding work in other industries due to language barriers. Also, we don't recognize foreign credentials, so people come here as doctors, they end up driving cabs. There's 200 right now in Toronto yeah. who are doing that. Okay, but Sean, okay, you know? uh, let's, let's talk about this. So, so these are some good examples about, mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. well, you're talking about the pursuit of the Canadian dream. Like, let's, let's, what's your main thesis here? My thesis is 
you don't have to go overseas to find it. You don't have to make it somewhere else. You can make it right here, and you can add value added. You can make it high quality, and you can charge a high price. And if you have good marketing, you get the message out to the public, you can, you can make a lot of money. Sure, but I think it also it would be a great idea if it's, it's fine for one company to do that. But it's also easier said in a way than done when you're encountering uh, like the high cost of doing business in Canada, the high cost of labor okay, well, this relatively. Is clearly, basically, well, this is cl clearly a question of not just the bottom line, right? This is a question of ethics and values. Well, so that's the pursuit it, of the Canadian well, dream. It, it's if you're about in business, having, it's a question of survival. Well, maybe we should change. Maybe we should change our idea of what business is. Well, you have to change more than your idea about businesses. I, you have I to love change your show the rules you. I'd like and the. Uh, it's it caters to um, the entrepreneurial a niche, Spirit, and that's yeah. where the fastest job growth is. So when we succeed in the future and become very wealthy, you're going to be dragged along with it, right? So you'll have been there the whole time. Meanwhile, Bell and Rogers, they're so, they're so out of touch with reality. Like, they're so, okay, well, wh whatever's hot and whatever's good. You, know, you guys are focusing on the small, the small markets, which could be tomorrow's leaders, Sure, you know? but I understand why uh, entrepreneurship is growing, largely because uh, the big companies are downsizing, as those dinosaurs are slowly dying, and yet sometimes I think that the entrepreneurs, uh, the small businesses are not getting the support that they really need. I think it would be a great thing if the governments, the federal government and provincial governments, started to support Canadian manufacturing, but when you get into official policy, even of the conservative government currently, it's like, no, globalization, decreased tariffs, don't protect the domestic market, let the jobs go overseas. But Doesn't matter what think. government is in power. When, it comes, when push comes to shove, that's what it's all about. We, we have to organize, you know what, we can too. We're, we're the number one connected uh, people to the internet, 68% according to Comscore. We can mobilize and reverse this trend easily. It'll take a while, but it's possible. But, but how, are we, how, how are we going to do it, Sean? Specifically, realistically, what is it going to be? I do think we have a cultural problem. I, I still think that, although we say, we talk about Canadians don't respect themselves enough or, 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 or prefer to do business with foreign companies, it's a cultural mindset problem that I think has been here since day one in this country. Well, every time uh, I've got a section of my book on honor killings, and I believe that multiculturalism encourages people to live life um, outside the mainstream and contrary to our values, and you end up with these kinds of things. So, but um, I'm not sure that there are these. I'm not sure that I understand that the issue of, of cult, uh, you know, uh, multiculturalism problems when people aren't, don't feel integrated and get into little he specific cultural it, and it, linguistic it's a, silos. It's a distraction, Hugh. But like, you come to this country, you're no longer an Italian, a German, a Chinese. I hear you. You have a language Sean, and a way I, of I life hear you. And, I'm just you know. saying I'm not sure that that is the cause of this I, cultural problem that we have as a country. I think it would be great if we had we're able to really step into our Canadianness and be proud of it and be working towards doing more of it and that would encourage the newcomers to, to participate more. I think that'd be a great thing. It's, it's, I'm just not sure how we're going to do that. It needs to start in the school system. They need to teach Canadian history, the good and the bad. They need to give people cultural capital. They need to tell people how this country operates and what it takes to be successful here. There, there has to be some effort on the government also to, well, to provide maybe, that view. And you know, maybe there needs to be, I mean, everybody's bringing in the, their different cultures. Mm. And that seems to stay with them when they come here, but we, largely we that's because we don't have a culture. We, no, Maybe we need we to start to... We don't encourage our own narrative. You know, so I don't know what our culture is other than hockey. All right, it's basketball, it's baseball, it's okay, northern Okay, that's news lights, to me, and I've been born, I was born here. Canoeing. It's canoeing, it's, the, uh, it's, our, it's our, the rock music, it's, the liter it's our um, publishing industry, it's the best-selling authors, the poets, the writers, you know, there is no, it's our democracy. There is no stereo well, I mean, there's you know, a stereotype of being Canadian, law, but you, you know, know what, when you think of England... Illegal, you can't kill your family if, you, if they're dating a boy. No, but when you think of somebody or, from England, there's a certain sense of who, a sensibility. When you think of somebody who's American, there's a sensibility. When you think of somebody, of somebody who's French, there's a sensibility. In Mexico, same they thing. They definitely know who Quebecers Canada, are, because they're noisy quackers. Quebec, yes, but in Canada, no, we just... Quiet, passive. I think that's changing. I think we're sick and tired of it, and we're moving in another direction. And or is it that you're sick and tired of it? Yeah, I am actually. <laughs> I am sick and tired of it. I'm, I'm sick and tired of being a hotel in a doormat, and I want my I want my identity to be. I want to see my identity expressed in other people's ambitions, and I want to share my values with other people, and I want to see those reflected back towards me. I don't Are you finding that hard to do? No, I'm, it's, I, I see changes, but it's we've definitely erected lots of barriers. When we promote other people's cultures, we neglect our own. And you can't respect yourself unless you, you can't respect other people unless you respect, you respect yourself, yourself first. You have to, we have to put Canada first, 
and say, you know, you're coming to this country. Welcome, as you said before in other, other debates. We'll embrace you. Buy into, our, buy into our narrative, you know. Become a part of the next chapter. It doesn't have to look like to the last one. But, but if you're telling me that in the last census, only 5.8 or 5.9 million people called them Canadian first, right. are we really changing? You're saying you That's think it's That's up from about, you know, half a million to one million. That's a massive oh, increase. Oh, really? It's That's, a huge increase. Oh, I didn't know that. And there was a wow. 16 to 90% plea out. 16 to 90% plunge in almost every other identical ethnicity. So people are like... Okay. Feeling more okay. Canadian now. Okay. That's okay. a trend. So, okay. you know, maybe because Canada Goose is so popular and everyone's so worried about the research and motion company going under. Like, people feel anxiety about these things because they feel a connection, a cultural connection to these companies. Boy, all of a sudden they're going to get inundated with resumes because no, I bet you their turnover rate is really low. Okay. Now, Sean, we don't have a lot of time left. You've made some great uh, points here. Yes, but you uh, did. Yeah. is there anything else you want to say that's uh, just going to, you know, get your message across? today about pursuing the Canadian dream. Um, I agree with you. Let's pursue it. How do we do that? Well, you find out what you're good at and then you focus on that, ex you know, specifically and you tune out everything else and you just go after it. That's all you have to do. Just now everyone's how is that good different at something. In, but how is that different than in any other country? What makes that Canadian? Well, it's more like, a, it's more similar to the American dream where you take your ambitions and talents and you maximize them for the profit, for, for profitability. You make as much money as possible and if you make a huge pile of money, you'll probably need to employ people at some point to administer it because as you grow, you'll need help, right? So. In Canada, we're not about making money, we're about making a difference. We should start making money so we can have more money so we can make a difference. If you have more money, you have more time to make a difference. How about that? How does that sound? Let's, let's that makes sense, I'm, I'm, Sean. I'm agreeable. If I was a billionaire, okay. I could do a lot more than being a schmo. Like, obviously, I'd have a lot more time. I could <laughs> invest more money into things that I believe we in. We know you're a billionaire. You're just pretending. <laughs> All right, Sean. Well, as great, always great to have this conversation. Thank Thanks you, for coming. Sean. God bless today. you. Thank you very much. Now, if people want to get in touch with you and your stuff, your writing, your work, where, where do they do that? Well, I've got a research website called endoffees.ca. I've never seen you smile so much. And um, <laughs> I've done debates on your show. This will be the seventh one. Six on immigration, one on the corporate sell-off of Canada, and this is one on the Canadian dream. I actually think this so, is the most positive So Sean Dalton so on YouTube, S-H-A-W-N-D-A-L-T-O-N. You can see my debates that I've done with you guys on okay. these topics. Okay, Sean. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks Sean, for you're amazing. Thank you very much. Thank we'll you. We'll see you next time. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's it for the show, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Wow, Great I feel show, like this Sandra. lightning speed. Can we got to do that. Awesome. Okay, we got to take off because we got to get the heck out of here. Yeah. We'll be back tomorrow for more Liquid Lives right here on that channel.com. He's going paddling <laughs> with the boys. Uh,